So it's strange to do the welcome, uh, not in my place, but still uh, welcome everybody. And thank you for being here. I'm happy to make this uh, very short introduction to today's uh, uh, SIBBM lecture from uh, Edouard Bertrand from the University of Montpellier. And I'm here uh, not only because I'm extremely interested in uh, uh, Edouard's talk, uh, but also to give you a very, uh, I'm here as a member of the directors of the uh, society, SIBBM, to give you a small um, introduction to the SIBBM, who is together with uh, the University of Trento and uh, the CIBIO is uh, uh, contributing to the organization of this lecture and this uh, small workshop. Uh, I don't know how many of you know the society. SIBBM stays for uh, Società Italiana di Biophysica e Biologia Molecolare. Italian Society of Biophysics and Molecular Biology, uh, which is an Italian association uh, whose focus uh, is uh, especially in molecular and cellular biology, but especially in molecular biology. We are uh, more or less uh, a society not so little, not even so big, of about 250 members. The board of directors uh, is listed there. We have both uh, senior uh, members uh, in the board of directors, but also junior ones. Junior are typically postdoc of, uh, or early career scientists. And by the way, um, if you now will subscribe, you go to the website. Uh, we are now uh, asking for, uh, we have to refresh uh, the uh, board of director. In particular, we are looking for uh, motivated uh, candidates uh, to substitute the current uh, uh, junior members. The idea to have not only senior, but also junior members in the director board is really to give space to ideas and suggestions coming from the uh, early career uh, scientists working in Italy. So why being part of uh, SIBBM? First of all, to, especially if you are coming back from uh, an experience uh, abroad, uh, is uh, a wonderful place to get to know uh, the Italian molecular biology community. Um, also to make new acquaintance, find possible collaborator, find partner for grant, which is what we are always looking for, and so on. But also because there are several activities that the society uh, offers, uh, and also support, especially for the young investigator. If you are a member of this society, you can, as a young investigator, profit from uh, travel awards uh, or visiting fellowship that support economically either the participation, the first, the travel awards, uh, to um, the attendance, to support the attendance uh, to meetings uh, or courses or workshop or summer schools, um, as well as visiting fellowship, uh, the economical support of a temporary exchange uh, among labs uh, in the context, uh, uh, in the framework of, for example, a collaborations. We organize and support uh, both the organization and uh, economically the organization of CBBM lecture, like this one, uh, that we try to do four or five uh, uh, per year uh, around an institute uh, all around uh, Italy, uh, with the idea to help uh, both the local organizer, both in finding sponsor, in uh, defining a topic, in inviting uh, a, keynote lecturer in a specific topic, but also now we organize in this new format since two years uh, with the idea to also organize around the major lecture also short, uh, um, uh, short talks uh, from young people with the idea again to favor uh, the, the possibility for young investigators to present their work, to train in uh, the training to an audience uh, and also the exchange. Uh, being a member of the CBBM uh, give you access also to this uh, um monthly, um, it's a monthly newsletter that is really nice and full of information about grant uh, meetings occurring, job uh, alerts, uh, so you have uh, people post jobs offers and so on, especially is uh, extremely 
up to date in terms of uh, deadlines for grants, uh, fellowship, and so on. So very often also besides what, what uh, your uh, grant offers can really offer. I just uh, recently applied to a, an American grant uh, just because I read it there and our grant office uh, in uh, IO didn't know even about it. And uh, it has different type of po topics uh, that informs you. Um, we have recently uh, completely reformed the website, uh, which is a bit better organized. You can find many information, both on events, uh, which are sponsored by the uh, CBBM. For example, this I take yesterday is the announcement of this lecture. And you have information about uh, all the members. Uh, you have information about uh, local events, uh, which are organized uh, by the CBBM members, uh, and so on. We start to be a bit active also in the social media with uh, a Facebook page, which is run uh, by the young uh, members of the director, as well as a uh, Twitter. By the way, you can also ask uh, the, our communication to tweet uh, your papers uh, and uh, your uh, achievements, uh, your prizes, uh, to post uh, again your job alert, uh, and so on. So I think that uh, we also have a yearly meeting, which is called the CBBM Seminar. Next year will be in Padua. It will be mainly related to uh, metabolo metabo metabolism and omics approaches. But uh, I think this may be of interest for uh, many of you. Uh, we also will have a satellite uh, meetings uh, at the end of uh, the yearly annual meeting, precisely on uh, July the 3rd in the afternoon write down in your agenda 2020, which is uh, a satellite meeting uh, that is uh, um, especially organized uh, by Claudio Schneider uh, on uh, phase separation uh, with a very important speaker from the Europe, um, uh, European scene. Uh, it's already announced also in the website, so have a look. Uh, this uh, is a satellite. Uh, the idea is to make it joint so that people can participate to both, but you can also subscribe only to the joint. It's a half uh, an afternoon, uh, and it's in Padua, so also relatively easy to reach uh, for you. It will be totally free for it. So um, now I finish my sponsor. So I like to take the advantage of this to really um, promote uh, uh, the CBBM and ask you to join, especially for the young people. Uh, there are many opportunities uh, and uh, the cost of uh, the membership is really kept it low to make it uh, really accessible. By the way, um, there is the way to uh, become a member is written in the website. You can download the form, and you need the two members uh, to present you. I am a member. Paolo is a member, and uh, uh, Fulvio is a member. So I printed uh, 20 of these uh, um, um, forms. So in the, if in the break you want to join, uh, we are ready there to sign uh, to present it. Uh, this membership will be uh, for free for the next year for. Uh, uh, both uh, the invited speaker, you will be member of the Italian Society of Molecular Biology, but especially also for the younger speaker of today. So please, during the break, come uh, that we will uh, offer you a complimentary membership for this year. For the next year, well, we will do it now. It's December. It will be 20, 2020. Uh, so that's it. I want to thank you for hosting us, uh, Paolo. Uh, and I want to leave uh, the uh, place, the stage, uh, to Michela to introduce the speaker. Thank you. Thank you. OK. So it's really a pleasure to have Edouard Bertrand here. Um, Edouard is the head of the RNA trafficking and biogenesis group of the Montpellier Institute of Molecular Genetics, IGMM. Uh, he graduated uh, in uh, molecular and cellular biology at the University of uh, Paris uh, 7th. And he got a PhD uh, at the same university on cellular and molecular biology. 
Um, as a PhD student, he worked at the Institut Monod and then uh, at the Beckman Research Institute of the City of Hope uh, in the laboratory of John Rossi on ribozyme-mediated gene therapy, which was also my first uh, love. So, <laughs> um, and then he uh, moved uh, again as a postdoctoral fellow at the Institut Monod, uh, working on intracellular RNA trafficking and uh, for a period uh, also in Robert Singer lab, uh, the Albert, Albert Einstein College of Medicine in uh, New York. Uh, still working on intracellular RNA trafficking. Then he came back to France, uh, at the CNRS in Montpellier, um, uh, where uh, in 2003, he, he became group leader. Um, and he's still there as a group leader with a team composed of 10 people working on RNA biogenesis and trafficking. Uh, he has been working on RNA, I think for his whole uh, scientific career, uh, on the mechanisms and function of RNA localization. And there are several uh, uh, major papers uh, which he has um, published and contributed to. I will mention some. So the invention of MS2 GFP tagging method to label specific RNA in live cell, the demonstration of motorized RNA transport by a dedicated myosin in yeast, visualization of single messenger RNA molecules, uh, demonstration that Peabody's store messenger RNA, I'm jumping a bit because it's a very long list. Uh, screen of human cell lines by fish to find no localized messenger RNA. He has been working also on HIV-1 RNA, uh, looking at uh, it in live cells. So lots of uh, imaging techniques, uh, very important papers in cell. And uh, also on the biogenesis and transport of uh, uh, old kind of non-coding RNA, which are the small nuclear RNA, which are very important too. He was uh, demonstrating that the box CD motif uh, snow RNAs, in snow RNAs is sufficient for localization. And then uh, he identified nuclear bodies and cahal bodies uh, as assembly compartments for this uh, specific kind of snow RNAs in yeast and mammals. Uh, published several proteins which are important for the cap binding and localization of messenger RNAs. I, I will stop here. As I said, there are many other things that he did. Uh, he's group leader since uh, 2003. And he's also has been, just finished, to be scientific director of the imaging facility in Montpellier, which I think it's uh, you know, what you will hear uh, today uh, putting together the RNA research and the imaging and uh, having very important discoveries by putting these two uh, fields together. So please, Edouard. So it's a great pleasure to be here in this very friendly atmosphere. And I would like to thank uh, you for hosting me and giving us the chance to present you what we are doing in the lab. Uh, do you have a point on Yes. OK, thank you. Uh, OK, so uh, as you all know, uh, the central dogma of molecular biology states that the genetic information is stored in DNA, transcribed into RNA from which you make proteins. And the interesting thing from a cell biologist's point of view is that this occurs in the very complex environment of a cell, which has many compartments in the nucleus and also in the cytoplasm. And uh, so the question that interests us in the lab is to understand a gene expression, but in the context of a living cell, to go from a linear model to a real uh, 3D organization of the cell. And what we try to understand is to understand how cell organization influences gene expression, and conversely, how gene expression contributes to cell organization. And what we do is to use a lot of fluorescent microscopy uh, approaches in fixed on live cells. And what, what we like to do in the lab a lot is to image RNA molecules, either in fixed cells using a single molecule fish method, or uh, DMS2 system or related systems. 
So we have uh, two research teams in the lab. So what we do is to develop uh, microscopy approaches, and we study their transcription. And more recently, uh, we studied a lot of RNA localization on tra translation, local translation. And this is what I will be talking about uh, today. So if you take uh, just a regular cell, like a HeLa cell growing in a plate or, or in a cell alike, so if you look at uh, a given RNA, you will see that it's from more or less randomly distributed in the cell, and it makes protein pretty much everywhere. But however, in some cases, the RNA localizes to a specific site in the cell, and this allows for localized protein synthesis. And this has been shown to be important in, in many different contexts. So a little bit of history, so uh, RNA localization has been discovered um, uh, mostly in, in embryos, so in drosophila embryos, where it is important for patterning the anterior posterior axis of the embryo or the do dorsoventral axis. It has been also shown to occur many years ago in xenopus oocytes. And also it was found that it occurs in somatic cells, so this is work from the Singer lab, where he showed that the beta-actin mRNA is localized at the leading edge in fibroblast, and is important for keeping the motility of the cells. And uh, about 20 years ago, it was also found to occur in a more simple organism like yeast, and since then it has been also found even in bacteria. So the ability to localize RNA and to translate protein locally is important in uh, many different uh, systems. And in fact, so the, one of the main functions, as I said, is translate a protein locally, and this has been shown to be important for asymmetric cell division, in particular in, in eggs on all sites on, uh, in somatic cells also, for more generally for cell polarity, and uh, also for synaptic plasticity in neurons, so it, it plays a very important role for uh, controlling uh, the, the content of the synapse locally on allowing LTP, for instance, <coughs> and also it was shown for process we will not think about in the first place, like cell cycle or signaling or etc. So how are the, the point I want to make here is that uh, RNA localization is important not only to translate a protein locally, but it can also be important for the purpose of RNA metabolism by itself. And there are two well-known examples. The first one are P-bodies, which are a, a, a non-membrane structure of the cytoplasm that concentrate RNA binding protein on a lot of RNA. And it has been shown that RNA that localize in P-bodies, they are not translated, so they are there for being stored for a long time before the cell can use it. And another case are stress granules, which are also a cytoplasmic compartment which is devoid of membrane, and that forms when you submit cells to a stress. And it, there is no translation there, so it's only for the purpose of the RNA metabolism that the RNA localizes there. So about 10 years ago, so uh, the, Eric Lecuyer uh, published uh, the first systematic study of RNA localization in Drosophila. So they studied about uh, two, more than 2,000 mRNA in a Drosophila embryo using fluorescent uh, in-situ hybridization. And what they showed is that uh, about 70% of the mRNA that they studied are localized in, uh, in the embryo at the intra intracellular level, and they describe a number of classes. So <coughs> this changed the paradigm in the field, because before that paper, people were thinking that uh, RNA localization is the exception. You know, it's only one or two mRNA that are localized for very specific purposes. And this paper showed that, in fact, this is a very general phenomenon that, uh, that uh, uh, in, in implicates a lot of different uh, mRNA species. So I will talk a little bit about uh, the technique. So in that paper, they used the fluorescent in-situ hybridization. And, uh, so if we go back in history, the first uh, technique that was developed was using radioactive, radioactive probe, starting back from the 60s. So in the 80s, people moved to uh, colorimetric approaches, and in the 90s, to fluorescent approaches. And that, that's the technique that was used in uh, Eric Lecuyer's paper. And in 98, so the lab of Rob Singer uh, made a very important breakthrough. They, they showed that you can detect single molecule of mRNA by doing fish, and they dubbed the technique single molecule fish, and the technique has been used quite a lot for many different purposes. 
And then, you know, that technique stays relatively uh, without much development for about uh, 15 years. And in 2013, so uh, people have made new developments to, to try to make the technique uh, accessible to high throughput method or to multiplexing method using a variant that are called Segfish or Merfish. And in the more recent paper that were published just a, a couple of months ago, uh, the lab of Longkai, for instance, showed that uh, you can detect up to 10,000 10, mRNA in the same cell. So you can do both single cell genomic and also spatial analysis of, of gene expression. So how single molecule fish is working? So the basic idea is to hybridize many different oligos against the same mRNA. So you can cover uh, most of the mRNA with oligos that are fluorescently labeled. And because you multiplex the, the detection, so uh, the, the signal, when you have a probe that binds the proper RNA, you will have many probes that bind to it. And when a probe binds the wrong RNA, you will have only one or two probes. So the number of oligos gives you a, a high signal to noise ratio, and that allows you to see single molecules. So for instance, that's an example. That's, uh, we labeled this mRNA, uh, which codes for CREM1 fused to GFP using probe against the GFP. These are the parental cells. You can see that you have this single uh, tiny spot in the cytoplasm, and you can show that each spot corresponds to a single mRNA. And the bright spot in the nucleus corresponds to the transcription sites, and it's brighter because you have multiple polymerases that are transcribing your gene. And uh, so the technique works very well. So um, in the more recent uh, paper where they, they used this uh, more higher throughput technique, so there are three papers so far that uh, did systematic studies in mammalian cells. Uh, so what they found is different localization classes. First, uh, several class of RNA that localize uh, around the nucleus. One of, of the main class being RNA coding for secreted protein, which are known to be translated on the endoplasmic reticulum. And then the second class was RNA localized on the mitochondria. On the third class, RNA, mRNA localized at the periphery of the cell. And many of them, are, but not only, are related to the actin, actin metabolism. So when we started the project, we were interested in determining whether there are more localization patterns than what was described. And we also wanted to, to determine how RNA localization correlates with protein localization to find new cases of uh, local translation. And uh, so in my talk, I will uh, talk about three topics. So the first is a dual RNA protein screen that we made in, uh, in HeLa cells that allowed, allowed us to find new uh, mRNA translated locally. Then I will uh, talk about a method that we and others developed that allows you to visualize the translation of single mRNA in fixed on live cells. And then I will go on how you can use this technique to answer some of the questions that arise from our screen. So basically, uh, to do the screen, we, we took advantage of a library of cell line that was developed by the lab of Tony Hyman in Dresden. So what they did is to use a, a BAC, bacterial artificial chromosome, that contained entire human gene, including you know, all the non-coding sequences, enhancer, promoter, intron, 5 parent supramutier. And what they did is to insert a GFP on a selectable marker. So the GFP is in frame with the, the protein of interest. And then they, they put back the modified back in cell lines. Each, each cell contains a tagged uh, gene. And like this, there are 3,000 TILA cell lines that each contain a different gene. So uh, this has been used to do proteomic studies and also to look at uh, uh, protein localization because the advantage is that you keep all the endogenous regu regulatory sequences. So that allows you to express the protein at the proper time on the, with the proper level. But also, you also keep all the non-coding sequences on the RNA. So potentially, you keep all the localization sequences. And so we thought we could use the, the library to look at RNA localization and protein localization at the same time. And the idea was rather simple, is to make a probe set against the GFP RS neo tag at the RNA level. So we we'll take the RNA. And this way, we could, we could detect uh, for all the genes of the collection, both the RNA and the protein. And that's uh, what uh, we did. <coughs> and this is an example from uh, one of the cell lines that expressed this uh, TERF1 protein that uh, <coughs> labels uh, centromeres. So you can see that this is the GFP channel. You can see the GFP very well. This is the fish channel. You can see all the single mRNA. So you can indeed look at the two of them together with a very good uh, sensitivity. So the advantage of this screen is that uh, 
First, we can look at the same time at the protein on, on, on the mRNA. The second advantage is that we use always the same probe set, so the signal quality is constant and always very good because in larger screen, which I will maybe describe a little bit later, so you have issue with the probe set being not uh, always uh, working perfectly well. So, so far, we did a screen on 500 uh, mRNAs and we found nine different localization classes looking at the mRNA. So the first class corresponds to mRNA that are randomly distributed in the cytoplasm, which we call uh, random. The second class, the RNA clusters in very tiny uh, cytoplasmic structure, uh, which we call the foci. The third class, the RNA cluster, uh, also clusters, but we can still see single molecules. And the, the fourth class, uh, the RNA is even more dispersed, but not homogeneously distributed in the cytoplasm. And the second classification we made is when we look at the distance to the mRNA to the cell membrane or to the nucleus. So we found mRNA that accumulate in cytoplasmic protrusion, which in fact what is a class of RNA that has been described before. RNA that goes around uh, the cell edge, that are around the nucleus, so it is also has been described before, and also a new class where the RNA accumulates at the nuclear envelope. And we also, uh, that's in interface, and in mitosis, we also find a class of mRNA that localize on the, on the centrosome. So the first interesting uh, property that we uh, observed and we are doing the screen is that, in fact, uh, when we look at the cellular level, there is a lot of heterogeneity in mRNA localization. So the, the first heterogeneity comes from the fact that uh, some cells localize the RNA and others do not localize the RNA for the same mRNA in the same population. So, um, on, on, so in some genes, most of the cells have the RNA localized, for other genes, only a small fraction. And this is quite different to the cases that are known before uh, in embryo, for instance, where the RNA localization is very stereotyped. You know, all the embryo will have the RNA, nanos RNA at the posterior pole, in those fila, and et cetera, et cetera. The, the process of RNA localization seems to be much more plastic in cell lines than in embryo. And the second observation was that some RNA show mixed pattern. Uh, so we, you can have several patterns in the same cell, or also in different cells, you will have different patterns. And this is an example that um, I, will describe, I will describe in more detail a little bit later. So it's a RNA coding for the ASPM protein, which is important for the function of the spinal pole. So in the interface, the RNA decorates the nuclear envelope and also accumulates in the cytoplasmic foci. So we have two patterns already. And in mitosis, the RNA changes localization and then accumulates on the, uh, on the spindle pole, on the mitotic centrosome. So this shows that in cell lines, so you can have very highly complex pattern of spatial temporal regulation of RNA localization. So now if we look at a global level, the results of the screens, so we analyze about 500 mRNAs. So we found about 30 that are localized to different classes. So the most abundant classes is RNA that accumulate in foci. And then we find a few at the nuclear envelope, in clusters, in cell protrusion, and etc. So um, if we aggregate the numbers, so we have about 7% of the mRNA that have a non-random localization in HeLa cells. So that's much less than has been found in Drosophila, because in Drosophila they reported as much as 70% of the mRNA. However, if you look a little bit more carefully in Drosophila, so the, there are several classes where the RNA, in fact, is localized because it is absent from, from one compartment, let's say the pole plasma or the apical pole at, at the blastocyst stage. So if you look only at localization, localization classes where the RNA accumulates somewhere, the number drops to about 20% of localized mRNA in Drosophila. So that's already a bit closer to the 7% that we have. And it means that if we extrapolate to the level of the entire genome, so we, we might have a couple thousand of mRNA that localize in cell lines. So then we looked a little bit more in detail into this uh, class of RNA accumulating accumulating in foci. And the first question we had is whether uh, some of these foci were P bodies, because it's well known that uh, P bodies contain a couple of thousand mRNA, so that's expected to be an abundant class. And indeed, so out of the uh, 19 um, mRNA accumulating in foci, we found 14 that are uh, in P bodies. So that's, uh, you can see here, for instance, so this mRNA accumulates in this foci, and they're all co-localized with P bodies. So indeed, localization of mRNA in P bodies is rather frequent, but we found four that accumulates in foci that are not P bodies. 
So uh, potentially something uh, quite quite interesting. Okay, so did we find some potent potential cases of uh, local translation? So for this, we compare the localization of the mRNA with the localization of the protein, and we find a number of cases. So this is an mRNA that codes for a mitochondrial protein. So the protein here uh, labels the mitochondria, and you can see that the mRNA indeed accumulates at the mitochondria. So this belongs to a class that was already known. But we find new places where local translation was not known to occur. So this is an mRNA that codes from a, for a protein that localizes at endosome. So the GFP type protein labels endosome. And you can see that the mRNA indeed accumulates also at the surface of the endosome. So you can have local translation on endosome as well as on mitochondria. And then we found this mRNA ASPM that uh, during mitosis accumulates at the, the centrosome. And indeed, the protein also accumulates at the spinal pole and decorates a microtubule. And then we found this uh, uh, mRNA that, that codes for a kinesine. So the mRNA accumulates at uh, the tip of cellular protrusion, and the protein also accumulates there, suggesting that it's also translated locally. So in, in total, so we found that local translation is uh, occurring in, in some places that were not known before, such as the endosome. Also, we found a couple of mRNA uh, uh, <coughs> localized on the Golgi with the protein, on centrosome, on cytoplasmic protrusion, on, uh, on also in cell age. So we also had cases uh, that we thought were very interesting, where the RNA localized, but the protein doesn't accumulate where the RNA is located. So for instance, this kinesin accumulates also at the a type of cytoplasmic protrusion, but the protein localizes everywhere and doesn't show any strong accumulation here. And this is a, a, a gene coding for the large subunit of the DNA in motor. And, uh, in fact, so the RNA accumulates in foci. So these foci are not P-bodies. It's one of the cases that are not P-bodies. And the protein, in contrast, is localized everywhere in the cytoplasm and doesn't show any particular accumulation in these foci. So the question, of course, is then what is the function of these foci or the RNA localizing at the cytoplasmic protrusion? So uh, with this screen, you can start to ask the, answer the question, why do cells localize RNA? And we can do it because we took an unbiased approach. We just took random genes and look at the RNA on the protein and uh, analyze whether we have a local translation or not. So indeed, so uh, we have cases where the RNA uh, co-localized with the mature protein, where the, so the RNA localization is likely used for a local translation. So we have uh, 10 cases like this out of uh, uh, 30 localized RNA. So this indeed is frequent, but not too frequent. Then uh, we have a lot of cases where the RNA are in P-body. So in that case, the RNA, the RNA localizes for uh, the purpose of being stored for some time and not being translated. <coughs> and then uh, we have all the other cases where we don't know yet wh why the RNA are localized. But the idea is that perhaps uh, you have a local translation, but it is not important to localize the mature protein. The local translation of the RNA is important for the nascent protein because uh, you have some specific steps that are required for the nascent protein and not for the mature protein. So this could be the case, for instance, if you want to assemble co-translationally co your protein with a partner, or if you want a specific translational regulation on uh, things like this. So to address uh, this point, in fact, uh, we need to know where the RNA are translated in the cell. So we, we can tell where the RNA is located, where the protein is located, but what you really want to know is where translation occurs. So for this, uh, uh, the question is, can we vi visualize translation in live cells? So for this, you need to see single molecule of RNA, which we can do, but you also need to visualize single molecule of nascent protein. And this was a bit of a challenge because GFP cannot be used for this because it has a slow maturation rate for the chromophore is in the range of tens of minutes. So you will never see the translation site using GFP, so you need another system. So the system that um, we and others uh, developed is based on arrays of protein tag. So the basic idea is so you, you take a, a short epitope tag so just, so, such as the HA tag, and you simply multimerize it. Uh, and the idea is that as for the SMFish experiment, because you have multiple antibodies binding to your 
protein of interest, you will be able to see single molecule of protein. And because uh, if your antibody is, is uh, fluorescently labeled, you will see the peptide as soon as it emerges from the ribosome. So you will be potentially able to look at a nascent protein. So we initially, we did this exactly like this, using a repetition of the HA tag. So we, we fused it to this protein, which is, which is a nuclear protein. And the system indeed works. So this is an uh, immunofluorescence, which is a, a protein tagged with 24 HA repeats using an anti-HA antibody. So we can see the, the protein in the nucleus with where it is supposed to localize. And we can also see spot of the, uh, uh, the, the protein in the cytoplasm. And we have, a, we had evidence to show that these are single molecule of proteins. And in some of these cases, this spot co-localized with the mRNA, suggesting that uh, we indeed could see translation site. So the, the, however, the problem with this method is that it was very hard to have a, a stable expression of the tag protein, probably because the cells don't like too much to have a repetition of uh, DHA tag on the silence expression. So then we turn to uh, another system, which is called the SunTag, which was developed by uh, Marvin Tannenbaum when he was in Ron Valley's lab. So what is the SunTag? So it's exactly the same idea of the HA tag, except that they use a different epitope antibody couple. So there is an epitope derived from the yeast GCN4 protein, and for which they had the single chain antibody, which can be fused to GFP. And then when they first uh, developed the system, that exactly the same problem that we had, but they were smarter and they improved the epitope uh, to improve the solubility of the epitope. And they came with a version where it still affects a little bit the expression of the tag protein, but not much. And, uh, and they show that you can see a single molecule of protein using uh, 24 repetition of your sun tag, and you can use it in fixed cell or in live cells. So then to look at translation, the idea was rather simple, was to take uh, our protein of interest, so in that case was again the KE67 protein, uh, <clears throat> and to fuse it with the repetition of the sun tag. And uh, so what we did is exactly this, so we inserted the selectable marker to make stable cell line, and uh, the expectation was that uh, because we know that uh, mRNA are translated by uh, multiple ribosomes, uh, polysomes will be very bright because they will contain uh, many nascent chain of the protein of interest and they will be brighter than a single molecule of protein. So we made a stable clone with this construct, and in fact, that's what we see. So if we look in the cytoplasm, we can see a couple of uh, bright spots, and then a number of uh, much dimmer spots, which you can hardly see here. And um, <coughs> the evidence that the bright spot correspond to, uh, to polysome came from two experiments. So first, if we treat with, pro we treat with promycin for 15 minutes, so that's a translation inhibitor that inhibits uh, a translation elongation. So you, you uh, lose the bright spot, but you keep the tiny spot that corresponds to single molecule of proteins, indicating that indeed these bright spots are related to translation. And the second experiment was to do a co-localization with the uh, dmRNA itself by a single molecule fish. And indeed, every bright spot <laughs> that we see with the sun tag correspond to co-localize with a single molecule of the mRNA of interest. So this shows that indeed, uh, this bright spot that correspond to single polysome that we can visualize in that case in fixed cells, but we can also do it in live cells. Uh, so what you can do with the tactics, so you can do many things. The first thing is to quantify the signal. So you can uh, determine how many mRNA are translated in a cell, and you can do this for many cells. So in that case, we had a great heterogeneity from cell to cell. Some cells do not translate any of the mRNA uh, that we had, and some cells translate all the mRNA molecules. And what you, you can also do is, is to count the number of ribosomes on your, on your uh, polysome, because you know the brightness of a single molecule of protein. So you can calculate uh, the brightness of your polysome uh, in numbers of uh, molecules of proteins. Uh, which means in the number of, of uh, ribosomes. And you, we could show that in that case, the ribosome load for the translated mRNA varies from a few to many, with a, a peak at about 15 uh, ribosomes per mRNA, which correspond to a spacing of about uh, 600 to 700 bases on the <coughs> mRNA. Then what you can do also to, is to look at this in live cells, and uh, to look at both at the same time at the, the translation, the polysome, an array of MS2 stem loop, which can be visualized by the MCP protein, which binds to the stem loop. 
so when you fuse MCP to a fluorescent tie, you can look at the mRNA in live cells the same way uh, as you look at the protein. And this is an example. So in green, you have the, the syntax signal. In, in red, you have the mRNA signal. So you see single polysome and single mRNA. So you can tell that, for instance, this mRNA is translated, this one also, but all these other mRNA are not translated. So basically, it allows you to look at uh, translation of single mRNA in live cells and to look at the spatiotemporal regulation of translation. So uh, what we observed using uh, this, uh, the same report uh, that I show you with K67, so this is uh, the, uh, the syntax signal. So you have all the polysomes here. So the time is in minutes. So we have a, a movie where we take about one image every couple of minutes. And you can see that if you look at this polysome, for instance, you can see that it's very bright at the beginning of the movie. Then it immobilizes and the, the fluorescence disappears. And uh, <clears throat> it doesn't disappear because we lose the spot because that's a 3D uh, slice of the same uh, spot. You can see that it remains in the stack, imaging stack, and it's really transition that is uh, uh, stopping. So the, all the ri ribosomes, they come off the mRNA, and we lose the signal. And in fact, if we track the brightness of the different polysome, we can see that the, the, the ribosome load of the different mRNA varies over time, so it fluctuates. Sometimes it stops, sometimes it stops and it starts again, and etc. So that means that uh, the translation at the level of single mRNA is stochastic. You don't have mRNA that translates or not translated, but the, the translation can, can vary in efficiency and can stop and start again. So the conclusion from uh, this part of the talk, so for non-localized mRNA, so when we look at the transition in live cells, so first the Syntag system allows you to visualize transition of single mRNAs. And we did um, uh, this study at the same time of uh, four other groups publishing the same uh, findings. So that shows you that the system is very robust and reliable because many people used it in a, in a relatively easy way. And you can also, to look at translation, use a repeated HA tag on flag tag, but in that case, you should not use it in a linear manner as we first tried, but you have to use it to use them in a scaffold, for instance, in the GFP. And, and that was shown by uh, uh, Tim Stasevich uh, in, his, in his paper in 2016. Okay, so what did we find? So, so the ribosome density is about one ribosome per 700 bases, and we observed that for several different mRNAs. So you can also measure the elongation rate, either by doing FRAP on photo bleaching studies on, on one polysome on looking at the rate of recovery, or you can also simply uh, look at the rate of uh, disappearance of the fluorescent signal uh, because of the stochastic fluctuation in transition efficiency. So from that, you can derive the elongation rate. And we measure a rate of about uh, 13 to uh, 15 amino acids per second, which is a bit faster than what has been evaluated by uh, uh, ribosome uh, profiling, for instance, where people have measured rather a speed of about 5 amino acids per second. So we don't know why. Uh, they are faster in our measurement, but uh, uh, that's what we got. And also one important observation is that translation of single mRNA can be stochastic uh, in live cells. Okay, so now let's go back to the, the question that uh, we had from the screen. So what about the mRNA localized in the cell? The localization doesn't correlate with the localiz localization of the mature protein. So that does the localized RNA, are, are they translated or not translated? So do we have local translation or not? So I will first describe you the case of this mRNA that goes for the DNA in heavy chain. So the mRNA accumulates in foci in the cytoplasm, which you can see here. So that we can see with the back, but we can also see it with the endogenous mRNA. In all cell lines that we looked at, we have the mRNA accumulating in foci and also being present as single molecule here. On the mature protein, of course, as I showed you, doesn't accumulate in the foci, but is present everywhere. So the question is whether these foci are, are oops, sorry, are translation site, oops, I have lost a slide. No, it's here, yes. Whether these foci are translation site or not. So what we did is to use a, a CRISPR system to insert a sun tag at the N-terminus of the DNA in heavy chain gene. And then we did a triple labeling experiment where we look at nascent translation using the, the sun tag channel. Then we looked at the localization of the, the tagged mRNA using uh, fish probes against the, the sun tag repeat. And then we looked also at the 
localization of all the mRNA coding for the DNA in chain because this allows us to visualize the foci in the cells because the CRISPR clone that we got are, are, were all heterozygous. So we have both tagged and untagged mRNA in the cells. So if you look in that particular cell, you can see that so here we have uh, one polysome because it's labeled both by the sun tag and the, the SM fish probe against the tag mRNA. And you can see that uh, uh, it seems to correspond to a, a single mRNA because it has the brightness of a single mRNA. In contrast, this spot here uh, is brighter and likely corresponds to a foci, and this uh, tagged mRNA that localized in the foci is also being translated. So that shows you that you can have translation of this mRNA both as single molecule uh, that are free in the cytoplasm or uh, in the foci. And in fact, if we uh, uh, measure the number of times we have translation of single mRNA or molecules that are localized in the foci, we found that in the foci, most of the mRNA are translated, as when they are outside the foci, they are less frequently, less frequently translated. So it seems that translation preferentially occur in the foci. So that shows you that the um, mRNA foci <coughs> that accumulate the DNA in mRNA, they correspond to specialized translation factories that where the RNA is translated. So we don't know uh, why we have these translation factories, but one idea that we have that maybe it corresponds to DNA assembly site because the DNA in motor is composed of uh, multiple subunits and perhaps uh, it's not that simple to uh, to build uh, this multi-subunit uh, complex, and maybe you do it in a co-translational manner, you start the assembly while the heavy chain is being translated. Okay, so uh, now we looked at the other mRNA that accumulated in, in foci that were not P-bodies. So one of the other one that has this phenotype code for the BUB1 protein, so it's a protein that is important for the, the cell cycle. So if you look at the RNA, you can see that the RNA uh, is present as single molecule, but also accumulate in these foci, which do not co-localize with, with P-bodies. And to determine whether the foci were translation site or not, we did the same experiment. We inserted the sun tag at the end terminus of the, of the protein and look at the translation of the mRNA. So here you have the, uh, the fish against the endogenous web one mRNA, and here you have the sun tag signal. So it's a bit hard to see on that picture, but in fact, so every time we have a, a foci of mRNA, almost we can detect a nascent translation signal. Here, for instance, here as well. And if we look at mRNA that are located outside the fossa, we almost never see uh, a signal from the, the nascent protein, which means that in that case, almost of the, all the mRNA is, is translated in the fossa. So it means that this mRNA is also translated in a specialized factories, which is not the same as the previous one because the fossa do not co-localize between each other. Or in that case, we also don't know the function of these factories, but uh, possibly important for the translational regulation of the gene. So the third case that I will describe you is a little bit uh, more detailed because we had insight into the function of the translation. So that gene code for beta-catenin, so it's a very important oncogene. gene. And what we found is that uh, the mRNA makes this very big foci in the cytoplasm. So on, uh, you also have the mRNA as single molecule. So the beta-catenin protein uh, was tagged with GFP because that's the the, in the back cell lines. So it, it accumulates at the cell-cell junction as expected. Very little expression. We have very small amount of signal in the foci. But uh, to show that indeed translation occur in the foci, what we did, we didn't use the sun tag in that case. We use an antibody that binds really the first uh, uh, 20 amino acids of the protein. And if you do this, you can see that we have a very strong labeling of the antibody that labels the mRNA foci. So that shows that the mRNA foci indeed correspond to translation site as well. So beta-catenin is very interesting because uh, it's well known to be regulated at the post-translational level. So it's a protein that is regulated by the wind signaling pathway, and you have two possibilities. When you have no uh, wind signal, so it's called a wind off, so in that case, the beta-catenin is uh, degraded post-translationally in a very rapid manner, and that requires the action of several proteins, axin, APC, and the kinase GSK3 uh, beta. 
on when, th when you apply a wind signal to the cell, so what happens is that you, you relocalize this protein uh, to the cell periphery, so they are no longer able to interact with beta-catenin. In that case, you stabilize beta-catenin, which can translocate to the nucleus and activate trans transcription of the target genes. And what we saw in the, in the back cell line was quite interesting, is that we had, we had the two types of cells in the population. So we had cells where we could see strong foci, and in that case, we had very little expression of the beta-catenin protein. And then we had some cells which, which were a minority in, in the population, where the RNA did not accumulate in foci, but was present as a single molecule in the cytoplasm. And in that case, we had a, we had a much stronger expression of the beta-catenin protein, which also accumulated in the nucleus. So that suggested that this situation corresponded to uh, a situation where the wind signal was on, let's say, and this situation corresponded to, uh, this localization corresponded to a situation where the wind pathway was off because we had no expression of the beta-catenin protein. So to prove this, what we did is to, to apply wind on the HeLa cells to look uh, at the consequences on RNA localization on protein expression. So in the in absence of wind signaling, what we see in most cells, we have the RNA accumulating in the foci, and we have very poor expression of the beta-catenin protein. And when we apply wind for a couple of hours, we can see that the RNA re relocalizes completely uh, from foci to a dispersed uh, uh, distribution as single molecule. So this spot here that corresponds to the transcription site, in fact, during the nucleus, and the RNA, mRNA in the cytoplasm is only present as single molecules. And, and we, of course, activate expression of beta cadenin protein, which accumulates in the nucleus now. So this shows that the wind signaling is able to regulate the formation of the mRNA foci, and in that case, it dissolves the mRNA foci. And it also suggests that the formation of the foci is linked to the, the fate of the protein. When we have a foci, we uh, don't have expression of the protein, suggesting that perhaps these foci are a place also that is linked to the degradation of the, the protein that is being translated. So if we go back to the, the protein that are important for beta-catenin degradation, so we have APC and axin, so these two proteins that directly, di directly bind to uh, beta-catenin protein, and they recruit gsk 3 beta, which is a kinase, which will phosphorylate beta-catenin, and that will lead to a recognition by an ubiquitin ligase, which will ubiquitinate it, and then the protein will be targeted for degradation. So then we decided to look at the localization of this protein, and indeed we found that if we make an immunofluorescence against uh, APC, so that's the, the mRNA foci that we detect by fish, we can see that the APC protein accumulates very strongly in the mRNA foci. And we found the same for axin. So it means that the degradation machinery of the beta-catenin protein, it co-localizes with the RNA foci where the protein is translated. And we went uh, uh, two steps further. We also look at the phosphorylated form of beta-catenin protein because it's phosphorylated on, on specific residue on these N-terminal serines, and we have phospho-specific antibodies. <coughs> so if we try to detect the, the phospho-related uh, form of beta-catenin, we can see that it also accumulates in the mRNA foci. So we not only have APC on axin, we also have the, the, the marks that target the protein for degradation. And even more, if we label uh, ubiquitin also by immunofluorescence, we can see that in, in the mRNA foci, we can detect a little bit of ubiquitin accumulating there, indeed demonstrating that these foci are likely the site of the degradation of the protein. So what happens then, the conclusion is that the beta cadenin mRNA foci, they are sites of co-translational protein degradation. So the protein is synthesized and degraded at the same place. And uh, yes, yeah, so that was interesting. So the the reason why is maybe for efficiency purpose because uh, by degrading the protein immediately after its transition, you ensure that uh, you will not have uh, some protein that will escape degradation because it will be it will be made somewhere else. So. Uh, <coughs> then we are interested into uh, what drives the formation of the, the foci. So, and in fact, uh, um, it is well known that APC and axin are able to make multi multimeric and multivalent interaction. 
So APC is a very large protein, uh, several thousand amino acids, and it contains many binding sites for beta catenin. So it has, depending on the isoform, it has between 20 to 30 binding sites for beta catenin. So it's a real glue for the beta catenin protein. And APC can also interact with axin uh, directly. And axin has the properties of being able to multimerize. If you increase the concentration, you, you can make oligomer of axin. So then, uh, Uh, this places in the framework of the phase transition uh, field where you can have aggregation of molecules when they're able to make multivalent interaction between themselves. So we, we decided to see whether this was the case. So <clears throat> to test whether APC and axin were important to make the foci, we knocked them out. And in fact, so this is the in the back cell line in, with the control sRNA, we have the mRNA foci. We don't have beta catenin expression because it's degraded by beta catenin. When we knock down beta catenin, we dissolve completely the foci. The mRNA becomes present as a single molecule, and we stabilize uh, the beta catenin protein. So indeed, APC is, uh, is uh, absolutely required to form the foci. And we did the same experiment with axin. Again, we found that if we knock down axin, we dissolve the foci, and we increase uh, beta catenin expression. And the last experiment was to test whether you need the nascent protein to make the foci. And indeed, that's the case, because if we inhibit translation with puromycin, uh, <coughs> we can very quickly, even after 10 minutes, you dissolve the foci, and the mRNA become uh, dispersed and present as single molecule only. So then, at the end, the model is the following. <clears throat> so we have <clears throat> the beta catenin polysome. So they translate the beta catenin protein, which is recognized co-translationally co by APC on axin. And because uh, now we can have multivalent interaction, because one polysome can bind, uh, can bind uh, no, uh, one mRNA as uh, many ribosomes, so it will be able to bind many molecules of APC. On APC on axin, they are able to multimerize, so they are also able to, to cross-link different polysomes between themselves. And like this, you can, you can form aggregates of polysomes and make this, uh, this mRNA foci where the beta catenin uh, is translated and also degraded. Okay, so in the last part uh, of uh, the talk, I will talk a little bit about this class of mRNA that accumulate at the nuclear envelope because uh, we found this interesting because it was not described in uh, mammalian cells. It has been described in yeast, where it's mostly involved in, uh, in uh, retaining mRNA in the nucleus before they are exported. But it was, as we found two mRNA like this, they're both see that the mRNA indeed decorates the nuclear envelope in both cases. So the question was, is the mRNA located at nuclear envelope uh, on the internal side or on the external side? In other words, is the RNA uh, being stuck on, on, on the nuclear pore when the mRNA is being exported to the cytoplasm? Or at the opposite, is the cytoplasmic mRNA that goes back to the nuclear pore maybe to facilitate import of the newly translated protein? So to address this question, we use two drugs. One is actomycin D, which inhibit transcription, and one is puromycin that inhibit translation. And we found that if we inhibit transcription, we still get the mRNA localizing at the nuclear pore, even after six hours of treatment. So it's unlikely to be the nascent mRNA going out that is retained at the nuclear envelope. In contrast, if we treat Uh, cells with pyromycin, even after 10 or 15 minutes, here is shown after one hour, you completely lose the localization of the mRNA on the nuclear envelope, suggesting that it's the mRNA being translated at the, on the cytoplasm that localized to the nuclear pore. So to show this more directly, we, uh, we inserted a sun tag by CRISPR at the terminus of the ASPM gene to look at where this mRNA is translated. And indeed, so here, Uh, we have the mRNA here, we have the syntax signal. You can see that we have uh, quite a few polysomes that locate on the, on the nuclear envelope. And because uh, it's the syntax, we can do this in live cells. And here, so you look at the SPM polysome, you can see that 
uh, this polysome here, for instance, it, it, it localized for quite a long time on the nuclear envelope. It's able to slide even. On, on average, we found that the polysome, they're located there for about half an hour, indicating that you really have translation on, on, nucle on the, the nuclear pore. So we don't know why uh, it is like this. Perhaps this protein needs to be imported to the nucleus in a co-translational manner, which will explain uh, this phenomenon. But <coughs> so this experiment raised the more general question is whether uh, the localization of the RNA is, is uh, dependent on the RNA or on the protein signal. Because the dogma in the field is that uh, it's the RNA that drives uh, RNA localization. So um, the RNA contains localization sequences at the RNA level generating the free permutier. And this allows it to be transported by motors or whatever to where it goes in, in the cell. And generally, the transport is supposed to occur when the RNA is not translated. And translation is, is supposed to resume when the RNA reaches its destination. And here, I show you a couple of cases where it's not like this because you need a nascent protein to localize the RNA. And as soon as you inhibit translation, you lose RNA localization. So we were interested to, to determine in the RNA that we found in the screen uh, if RNA was RNA dependent or protein dependent. So to answer this question, we inhibit the translation transcription. And we need translation either with pyromycin, which uh, uh, is a trans translation terminator, so you have almost no translation. Or we use cyclohexamide, which is an elongation inhibitor, in which case you keep the ribosome on the mRNA with the nascent chain, but you can not uh, have the ribosome elongating anymore. So this is, again, the SPM mRNA. So this time, during mitosis, so it localized at the center. Transcription, nothing. You inhibit translation with pyromycin, you delocalize the RNA very quickly. You inhibit translation with cyclohexamine, the mRNA is still localized. So that shows you that you need a nascent chain to localize the RNA at the centrosome. And because we had the Suntag cell line, we look at the mechanism by looking at the, the movement of ASPM polysome in live cells. So here you have a cell in prophase, and each dot here corresponds to a polysome, and you can see that polysome, they move very quickly to the centrosome, uh, demonstrating that they are recognized by motors and transported by motors to the centrosome. So this is uh, the reverse of the dogma that uh, we had in the field, that it's not the silent mRNA that, that is localized, it is the polysome that is localized, and the nascent protein chain is very important to, 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 to localize the polysome and also to transport it. And to go a little bit uh, in more deeper into the details, so we did a, a co-localization with the microtubules. So here you have also a cell in, in early prophase. So you have the syntax signal, so the ASPM polysome in green, the microtubule in red. So you can see first that uh, a lot of the polysome they co-localized with macrotubule, showing that uh, the, the, this mRNA is not translated everywhere, but is preferentially translated on macrotubule. And sometimes you can see that uh, you have this rapid movement of the polysome, and they always occur on microtubule, indicating that uh, uh, it's uh, most likely a motor that is transporting the polysome on microtubules. Uh, okay, so very briefly, I will uh, touch upon a different topic. So then we are interested to find whether there are more centrosomal mRNA in human cells, because we found one. So we're interested whether there are many others. So what we did is to do some technological development to be able to do a single mo molecule fish in a higher throughput, to be able to look at many mRNAs. And then we screen all the M mRNA coding for centrosomal protein. So. <coughs> to uh, do fish in a higher throughput. So what we did is to use an indirect uh, fish method. So the, the method that is traditionally used is to use fluorescent oligos to detect the mRNA of interest. And this is very hard to, to, make a, uh, to develop in a higher throughput because you will need to make a lot of fluorescent probe, which is very costly and very complicated. 
But what you can do is to use an indirect method where you use a primary probe that are not labeled, but that carry a little arm, which is al always the same for the different probes. And then you, have, you hybridize a secondary probe that binds to the arm, and that is fluorescent. So this way you can use always the same secondary probe that is fluorescent, and you can use different primary probes which are unlabeled. And this way you can develop many different probes in a, a cheap manner. Let's say, and the way the technique works uh, is uh, as follow. Uh, oops, sorry. So, uh, so what we do is to uh, order probes in a large scale by a parallel synthesis. <laughs> so we receive a, a tube where we have 10,000 or 100,000 oligonucleotides that we design against, uh, let's say, 1,000 mRNAs. So the way the oligos are designed is as follow. So for one mRNA, we have 50 different probes. So they carry a different hybridization sequence against that mRNA. Then they carry two extra arms that will be able, that will enable us to label them by the secondary fluorescent oligo. And then we have a barcode, which is gene specific. So, um, uh, all the probes of one gene carry the same barcode. So then we can do a PCR from this large pool of oligo to amplify uh, 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 all the probes of one gene. So then we can do the PCR, PCR in plates. So we can do 1,000 PCR. So we amplify every time the probe for one gene. And then we can, uh, what we do is to in vitro transcribe the PCR product by if we insert a T7 promoter, for instance. So we can make single strand probe like this that contain the hybridization sequence on the, on the flap sequence. And then we can hybridize the fluorescent oligos. And then we can hybridize this probe against the mRNA. So we do then the fish, we do it in 96 well plates, when mRNA per well. And we can do this in a relatively large throughput. And the technique works quite well. So these are examples of genes that we looked at. So you can see that you can see the single molecules of these different genes. So we did this for all the centrosomal mRNA. So we screened 600 mRNAs. We found a total of eight mRNA that localize on the centrosome. So I will show you one example here, coding for this uh, big D2 protein. So you can see the RNA localizing at the centrosome labeled by a centrin GFP marker. And what was interesting is that uh, when we treat cells with pyromycin, we lose localization of this mRNA at the centrosome. And that was true for all the eight mRNA accumulating in the centrosome. So it seems that we have an entire family of mRNA that localize to the centrosome, and, and they all depend on the nascent protein to localize to the centrosome. So that suggests that, uh, uh, in fact, the, the model for localizing the RNA in that case uh, reminds us of the SRP model for secreted protein, where we have the, the localization, localization signal is in the nascent peptide chain, which will allow the nascent protein to interact with the uh, motors or, or other transport system, and that will transport the entire polysome to uh, the destination, in that case, the centrosome. And in fact, so this mechanism uh, transition dependent RNA localization occurs for the centrosomal protein, but we also did all the localized mRNA that we found in the back screen, and with all of them except two, in fact, need the nascent protein to localize, which shows that this, this seems to be a general mechanism, and it occurs not only on the centrosome and the endoplasmic reticulum, but also on the endosome, the Golgi, and etc. And uh, that I will skip. Okay, and uh, so I would like to thank the people that contributed to this work. So the localization, localization screen was mostly done by uh, two students, Adam Safidin and uh, Rasha Shwaib. The Syntax system was developed by uh, Xavier Pichon, and the method, uh, the high throughput SMFish method, was developed by uh, Emeline and Marion Peter. And during these studies, we collaborated with two groups. One group that does biophysics, which helped us to develop uh, image analysis software that uh, uh, allow us to analyze the, our data. And also with Thomas Walter at the Ecole des Mines, which is an applied mathematician. And what he did is to develop software that allows us to classify RNA localization in an automated manner. So we don't have to look at the images. We can use software that would classify the mRNA in the different categories. And I thank you for your attention.
Um, beautiful work. I have just two quick questions. Um, the first one is regarding this model that you have nascent protein that determines localization. I was wondering whether you looked at specific uh, motifs that these uh, RNA have, or obviously these this short peptides have, that would sort of um, explain how they can get then localized to the cytoskeleton. Yes. So. Uh, 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 for the centros we look at this in more detail for the centrosomal mRNAs because we have eight mRNAs, so eight proteins that uh, uh, localize the mRNA in a protein-dependent manner. So we could not see uh, a common motif between the protein, but there are some trends. So most of these proteins are able to bind macrotubules and to interact with DNAs. So suggesting that uh, indeed, you know, the nascent protein could mediate localization of the, of the polysome. But we didn't do uh, you know, more detailed studies by uh, removing the domain or putting only this domain, etc. So, it, uh, so the, the motif in the protein, they fit with the idea, but it's not a single motif mm. that is the same for the different proteins. Okay. Do you think maybe secondary structures could be also involved? Uh, yes, so, in, so the, the domain that have been characterized are rather large domain. So okay. it's not like the SRP where you have a tiny stretch of hydrophobic amino acid that is sufficient to bind uh, SRP. It seems to be larger dom protein domains. Uh, but uh, we have to do the experiments to, to prove it. And the second quick question is obviously how, what's your general view um, of RNA localization, because this challenges what we know, as you said, about RNA. And there are, I mean, it's quite well established in the field that you have, as you said, uh, motifs uh, in the 3 prime UTR th that mediates, for instance, RBP mediated localization. So, do you think there are different pools of RNA that uses different sort of forms of localization? And there is something very particular about these RNA, maybe linked to the fact that they need to be localized at specific places in the centrosomes, I don't know, somewhere that really um, differ from these RNA that rely on their 3 prime UTR? Yes, yes I think there are uh, definitely different mechanisms. So uh, there is the traditional mechanism where the RNA carries the signal. And in fact, the, the two mRNA that we found in the screen that localize in an RNA-dependent way that do not depend on translation, they both correspond to the same class of mRNA that accumulate in cytoplasmic protrusion. And in fact, that class, it's known that if you only take the free permutier, it's sufficient to localize the RNA uh, to the cytoplasmic protrusion. So for the uh, other mRNAs, so the, the question is whether, uh, you know, uh, how many mRNA localize in a protein-dependent manner on, on an RNA-dependent manner. So we still have a very uh, partial view of the process. But uh, so most of the initial work was done in, uh, in embryo where, uh, you know, it's quite different than the cell line. So in cell line, as I said, uh, localization is heterogeneous. So first of all, it's not as efficient as in embryos in the sense that you always have molecules that do not localize. So it's only a fraction of the RNA that localize. On that, it may seem a lot when you look at the image, but if you, if you quantify, you know, in most of the cases, 10%, 20%, 40%, you know, 60% is a lot. Uh, and that contrast with embryos where it's, except in a few cases, most of the RNA is localized. And also another difference that, especially in drosophila, so the, so the, the development is very quick and needs to be ex extremely synchronous by, you need to synchronize a lot of different events and it makes sense to uh, uh, have a system that does not leak because the, the protein dependent system may be leaky because you start translation somewhere else. So maybe some of the protein, you know, goes God knows where and a fraction of the protein is made at the right place. And maybe for a cell line, you know, this is fine and it's good enough, but maybe for an embryo where you know you need very uh, a lot of different events you know that are going on at the same time and in a very fast manner, maybe the requirements are much more strict and you need a much stronger uh, special regulation of translation. So that would explain why these systems are uh, uh, RNA driven rather than protein driven. On the same in yeast or in yeast, so it's H1 is localized at the bud tip. So the, the cell division is this is very fast, it occurs only in a few minutes. So if you if you will start translation in the mother on a, on a, you will mislocalize only a few molecules very quickly, you know you, you will lose 
the benefit of localizing the RNA because you will lose the polarity of uh, the translation. So you, it's very important in that case to have a system that is totally silent before the RNA reaches the, the destination. But maybe in many other cases, uh, local translation helps, you know, the function of the protein, you know, incorporation in, into the target compartment, but it's not an absolute requirement. You know, if it's not 100%, still okay. So here, yeah. so thank you, Edouard. Very nice presentation, very interesting data. Um, I have a question which is somehow is related to the previous one. Um, have you tried to add, uh, to, to create a chimeric uh, mRNA? So meaning uh, if you have an mRNA which does not localize uh, to the um, to the central central centrosome. centrosome, and you add uh, the first 100, 200 nucleotides uh, of the mRNA, which localizes actually there. Do you see uh, that uh, this chimeric RNA localizes there or not? Yes, yeah, so we started this experiment, but uh, so far we didn't complete, so we don't know. What we know is that if we take only the cDNA, for, we did for uh, two of these proteins, so the cDNA is enough uh, to drive RNA localization. So you don't need the five prime and three prime here. Now, whether the nascent protein is sufficient so that we have not answered that. Okay, so the, the second question is uh, uh, regarding the RNA which localizes in the perinuclear. So uh, is there any mechanism or how this RNA can be anchored there? So you know, at the nuclear which, envelope? Right, which keeps the RNA there. So, uh, so uh, we don't know, except the, so the only thing we know is that, the, the, again, the nascent protein is important because if you treat with promycin, in a few minutes, the RNA delocalizes. So it's, uh, it's the nascent protein chain that is important to, to maintain the mRNA at the nuclear pore. And, uh, the simplest model will be that, uh, you know, the first... Uh, nascent protein shell will get into the nuclear pore and then all the other ones you know will will uh, will stick to the nuclear pore or the in protein or whatever helps them so as soon as you know the uh, since translation is continuous so as as long as as soon as you bind the nuclear pore you know you will only detach when you stop translating the mrna but we don't know the translating factor if it's an in protein a nucleoporin or whatever uh, so I have a bit of a general question because I'm not uh, extremely expert in this, but it's related to the answer that uh, you gave to Marilo, um, you know, which is you mentioned the difference uh, when you compare the drosophila embryo and uh, the cell line uh, of the different localization and compartmentalization. And at the same time, you said that in many situations, you think that in that case, you need a uh, very specific and coordinated uh, system maybe to unravel this phenomena. So I was thinking whether the cell line are the ideal model system to study this, if you are thinking of using whatever organoid, and especially maybe not at the steady state, but in a uh, transi sort of transition or uh, why either developmental transition or in response, you beautifully show the response to the wind cascade where you, you really see a dynamics because uh, you are pushing a system to respond to a sort of perturbation. So I was thinking whether an organoid in a developmental push tower either differentiation could be a nice model to specifically study some of these phenomena. Yes, no, that, that's a very good point. So indeed, so Kila says are not the best system to look at uh, you know, cell polarity in general or many different things. And uh, so, yes, now we want to do two things. So first, we would like to work with primary cells, so which are uh, much closer to uh, real functional cells. And then we would like to apply different stimulus to the cells to see how RNA localization can respond to different stimuli. Indeed, so that's the next step. So organoids, so that's a possibility too, that's interesting. It's also feasible because we can do it in plates, but uh, what we are thinking is uh, more to look at uh, neuronal uh, cells and uh, you know, where you can uh, you know, stimulate uh, neurons or not, and et cetera. And, uh, there are interesting questions with uh, regard to synaptic plasticity and, uh, and also how do we maintain, you know, because neurons are very long, so you need to have a protein homeostasis you know, at sites that are very distant from the cell body. So how do you bring the new proteins there? Is diffusion sufficient or maybe the RNA uh, will help you know, if it goes there a little bit? Uh, so. 
I also have two questions. One is, uh, um, I was kind of surprised in looking at uh, uh, the messenger RNAs that are present in these cells. Uh, some of those that you were showing are really few molecules, and uh, uh, out of those, few were uh, actively translated. So I was wondering, did you notice uh, among, so you tried several messenger RNAs and some 7% was actually localize, localizing in that way. Uh, is this the part of the messenger RNAs that are uh, with a low level of expression, so lowly uh, transcribed, how can you say? Yes. Very few. Yes, no, that's a good point. So the uh, in fact, uh, you know, the mRNA we looked at are rather uh, uh, more highly expressed than the average, and it turns out to be like this, we didn't choose it, to, than the average mRNA. So in the more recent screen we did where we look at the endogenous mRNA, and we look for families, so there is no selection on expression level or whatever. Uh, in fact, we found that many mRNAs that are expressed at, at very few copies. So you find 5, 10, 50. So a lot of mRNA have only a few copies per cell. And uh, so we didn't look at translation because we could not sun-tag these mRNAs, but we looked uh, by sun-tagging at, at a couple of mRNAs. And what we see is that, uh, in general, uh, uh, so if we tag housekeeping mRNAs, by CRISPR, so we look at the endogenous. So translation seems to be very robust. Most of the mRNA are translated on a, at quite a high level. If we look at a regulated mRNA, <coughs> like a localized or etc., then we have uh, different pictures. On a, only a fraction of the mRNA seems to be translated. And uh, <coughs> yes, with regard to expression, so there are two surprising things. So many mRNA are expressed at a much lower level than, than we imagine in cells. On the second, interestingly, if you look at transcription, this time, so gene expression, in most of the cases, you don't see the transcription side being on. Because, uh, like translation, translation is stochastic, transcription is also a stochastic process. And for most of the gene, transcription is very episodic. So you transcribe perhaps for 10 minutes, and then you don't transcribe for maybe three hours or 10 hours, etc. So what we call a uh, actively transcribed gene, in fact, most of the time they are not transcribed. They are only transcribed you know, from time to time. And for translations, we don't have a view, but uh, we would very much like to do some, some uh, sun tagging in a more systematic way to look at this. And uh, I'm sure we'll have surprises of, uh, you know, Thank you. how many For, for the so case of the beta catenin that you were describing, so you are describing a, quite a complex system just to destroy the nascent protein. So isn't yes. that um, energetically very, you know, a, a losing choice? Or, or, or is there a meaning for that? Yes, uh, <clears throat> that's a difficult question. So, um, well, from the energetic point of view, <clears throat> I'm not sure that it, this is very relevant for single cells, because at least in multicellular organisms, because if you look at uh, uh, pre-mRNA, for instance, it's well known that 90% of the, the pre-mRNA are degraded either after splicing or because you know, the RNA, uh, most of the nuclear RNAs are transcribed, they are degraded very quickly also. So that's a big energy, energy waste, if you want. So I'm not too sure that you know, energy is a limiting factor for single cells. But uh, nevertheless, why do you have such a complicated system for beta catenin? So we don't know why. So one reason could be to have a very fast activation, because uh, here you have the mRNA is already translated. And as soon as you detach, detach APC and axin from the from the on protein, you will stabilize the protein and you will have an effect. So that could be one reason. The second reason is that beta catenin is even more complicated. So uh, it has two functions in the cell. One is to function as a transcription factor in the wind pathway. And beta catenin has a second function, which is at the cell-cell the -cell junction, where it's an adapter, adapter between cadherin and the cytoskeleton. So, um, on that, you need, it's a, let's say, a more housekeeping function. So maybe this gene needs to have both housekeeping translation and a regulated translation. Or maybe it is why it has evolved such a complicated regulatory system. But uh, no, we don't know, of course. Thank you very much. So, very quick yeah. last question. Yeah, uh, a question 
still on beta-catenin story, is the ability of beta-catenin to be degraded itself required to localize the destruction complex on the translational sites? I mean, if you perform the same experiment with the um, mutant on the uh, <coughs> GSK3 beta target sites, is the destruction yeah. complex recruited on the translation side? Yes, that's a very good point. So we have not uh, uh, done the experiment. So I'm not sure of what would be the results because, uh, in fact, uh, uh, so if you do beta cadence itself, I would I would probably make the hypothesis that it will still work on like the foci and etc. But uh, we have to do it. But the 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 GSK3 kinases are important to phosphorylate beta catenin, but also phosphorylate APC and axin. And it is important for high affinity interaction between all the members. So if you inhibit GSK3 beta, so you inhibit phosphorylation of beta catenin, but you also dissolve the foci. But we don't know exactly what's causing that. So no, that's a good experiment too. Okay, thank you very much, Edouard. Thank you, thank you everybody. Nicole Bettin, uh, she's a, a PhD student, first year, right, in our <laughs> yes. PhD program in biomolecular sciences. Yes. Uh, she's doing the, the PhD in the laboratory of uh, Professor Emilio Cusanelli uh, in the lab of cell biology and molecular genetics. I guess it's your first uh, se official seminar? Yes. Correct? Okay. So, good luck. And she will talk about uh, Terra and uh, its role in human cancer cells. Please. Thank you. So, um, good afternoon and thank you for being here. I'm Nicole, as Paolo Macchi said, I'm a PhD student at Cusanelli's lab, and I'm going to present you some preliminary data on the um, locali study of localization dynamics of Terra in Human Cancer Cells Project. Um, the, the data collect were collected by me and two master students, which are Irene Gialdini, uh, mainly while she was at Chartrand Lab in Montreal and Laura Vino. So, first of all, telomeres are nuclear protein structures that are assembled at the end of chromosomes. They consist of double strand DNA repeats and a single strand free prime end of repetitive sequences. Uh, telomeres are normally bound by the Chantry complex, which is a complex consisting of, consisting of six different proteins, which are TRF1, TRF2, TIN2, RAP1, TPP1, and POT1. The centric complex is essential for the um, for uh, um, telomeric stability, for telomeric stability, yes, sorry, <laughs> and chromosome maintenance. Um, so uh, we, all, we all know that the DNA replication machinery is not able to fully replicate uh, ex linear extremities of DNA molecules, creating the so-called end replication problems. Uh, so um, we know that in, a, in absence of maintenance mechanism, telomeres shorten at every cell cycle. Most eukaryotes, to uh, counteract this action, uh, express um, a reverse transcriptase enzyme called telomerase, which elongates telomere during the cell cycle. Telomerase, as shown in this picture, is, com is composed by a catalytic domain called TERT, an RNA subunity called TR, and uh, accessory proteins. Telomerase is known, is known, of course, to localize at telomeres. But we also know that telomerase to un, has to undergo processes of maturation and assembly to become an active en, uh, enzyme. And this, this occurs at casual bodies, a particular subcompartment of the nucleus uh, that is normally implicated in the processing, assembly, and final maturation of small nuclear RMPs, in particular, in this case, telomerase. Uh, so, um, Terra is a long known coding RNA that is, that is transcribed by the RNA's polymerase II from the sub telomeric, from sub -telomeric regions of telomeres. It consists of, sub, of a sub telomeric derived sequence and telomeric repeats. Uh, its transcription is uh, um, regulated by the presence of CPG island at the sub telomere. It is found normally in the nucleus. It is five, uh, 
It has a um, five gram cap and can be found in the nucleus also in a polyadenylated version that is free prime end. <coughs> so uh, all, all of us know that uh, telomeres have a heterochromatic structure. Terra has been proposed to uh, participate in the heterochromatic formation and interestingly, uh, it has been seen that Terra can interact with 3 methylated lysine 9 of histone 3 and with the HP1 protein, acting, so acting as a scaffold for the recruitment of chromatin remodeling factor to telomeres. Then we know that Terra can form DNA RNA hybrids with telomeric DNA, also called this R loop, that are um, that um, enhance uh, homologous recombination at telomeres. Last but not least, we know that telomerase, telomere, um, terra, sorry, terra can interact with telomerase enzyme. The location where this um, localization of core and the terra function if telomerase, in telomerase regulation are still unknown. So we know that terra transcripts mainly localize at telomeres as, it, as can be seen in this picture. We can find terra almost at, uh, mainly at TRF1 sequence or telomeres. But we don't know for how long Terra has been here. So is this localization constitutive or not? So to better study this, uh, this kind of localization, uh, the lab developed uh, um, an approach, a uh, live cell imaging assay, to isolate Terra in living cells. Sorry, in living cells. So uh, an, um, an IGS, the IGS cell line has been engineered and uh, presented at the subtelomere of the chromosome 15Q, um, an MS, a temper MS2 sequence, permitting us to visualize Terra in li during live imaging experiments. Um, through this approach, we saw that 44% of Terra MS2 GFP signals co-localizes with TRF1 MCR signals, but it is only 44%. What about the other 56% of, of Terra? Where are they? So um, it has also been seen through live cell imaging with a time lapse that the localization of Terra at telomeres, it's, uh, it is only transient. It changes. It's not constitutive. So now we know that uh, Terra is not only at telomeres, but also that telomer, um, Terra, when it's at telomeres, is not there in a constitutive manner. So uh, only to remind you, this slide also is only to remind you that telomerase can be found both at telomeres and casual bodies, where it undergoes processes of maturation. So our question was, since we know that Terra can interact with telomerase, that Terra uh, and that um, telomerase uh, is both at telomeres and casual bodies, but we know already that Terra is at telomeres. Do Terra RNAs localize also at casual bodies? So the first thing, we, I use uh, this engineer version of AGS, expressing Terra transcript tagged with a MS2 sequence, and transduce them with a lensiviral vector encoding for the best, mar best known marker for casual bodies, that is coiling protein. And uh, so if there was a co-localization event between Terra and coiling protein. It was a surprise because I found out that more or less between 40-45% of cells that were presenting both signals, so simultaneously were presenting MS2 and coiling protein signals, were presenting at least one co-localization event. So uh, knowing this, we moved then in fixed cells. So we studied the same thing in fixed cells. Uh, of course, this in AGS. And I used, in this case, two different markers of casual bodies that are coiling and TCAP1. Uh, first, we, I, we set up conditions to see total Terra population uh, into the nucleus, then immunofluorescence experiment to see casual bodies, put together the, the techniques. And what we found is that also in fixed cells at the entire population level of Terra. Of course, before we were speaking about Terra derived from a 
only one chromosome. Here we, we are speaking about terra, total terra population of a cell. Sorry, of a cell. We found out more or less the same results. I found that 40, between 40 and 45 percent of cells presented at least one colocalization event between coiling or TCAP, so casual bodies and terra. Um, we decided to validate these results with another technique, with RNA precipitation technique, where we immunoprecipitated, of, always in NGS cells, three, the three markers, you know, three markers, so TCAP1, the one I used before, and also coiling, adding also SMN to have a better view, and look at the terra enrichment in AGS cells, in particular at these three immunoprecipitated samples. And as we can see here, we found that at the RNA terra is levels is enrichment is enriched in uh, uh, the three pull down different pull down. Okay, so in NGS these results are more or less validated because we have we found out that terra is present also uh, at casual bodies also through the immunoprecipitation experiment. So we moved to other three different lines, HCT116, ELA1.3, and VA13. <laughs> what we have seen is that the 13% 13, 13 of HCT cells, 3% of ELA, and 24% of VA13 cells presented colocalization, at least one colocalization event between terra and coiling proteins. So these results together um, permit us to say that Terra is located to casual bodies in cancer cell, but it seems to be in a cell line dependent way. Then we remember that Terra can interact with telomerase. So we move to analyze if Terra and the TR subunity of telomerase are colocalizing each other. And using the three cell line that we used for the last experiment, before, so HCT, ELA, and VA13. First, we set up condition to see the HTR, subunity of telomerase, through SM fish. Then we move to uh, combining this technique with the immunofluorescence experiment. No, sorry. With another, combining the two probos me fish, Terra and TR, and look at the overlay, so the presence of colocalization event. And also here has been found colocalization event in HCT and HeLa, of course not in VA13. We use in this case VA13 cell line as a control because it, it is known to not express the R subunity, so telomerase. So, but let's get to the numbers. So we saw 92% of HCT cells and 50% of HeLa presenting an at least one colocalization event between Terra and HTR subunity. In particular, 17% of Terra foci present in HCT and 13% of Terra foci in ILA were colocalizing with TR. Then, knowing that TR and Terra are localizing, so confirming the fact that they are interacting, we move to analyze if this colocalization between Terra and TR was present also at casual bodies. So we use coiling as a marker, we combined SM fish and IF, and so found out overlay, so merge, so uh, col triple colocalization events. But let's see the numbers. So 9% of cells, of HCT cells, and 3% of ILA cells presenting uh, uh, the triple colocalization, so Terra coiling, TR colocalization. But interesting is that 70% of HCT casual body that were positive for Terra, but 100% of Vila casual body that were already positive for Terra were also presenting TR. So this result, this partial result, suggests us to say that Terra and TR colocalize and colocalize at casual bodies. So, but we know also that both Terra and TR localize at telomeres. So what about the colocalization between Terra and TR at telomeres? So we moved on. Before, we, uh, we saw Terra localizing at TR, as TRF1, so at telomeres. Of course, we found out that 
Terra is localizing at telomeres. It was already known. So in HCT, 100% of cells and six, more or less 70% of VILA and 92% of VA13 presented Terra at telomeres. But 24% of Terra, so 24% of Terra in HCT, 38% of Terra in ILA and 43% of, uh, of Terra present in VA13 were localizing at telomeres. So these parts of Terra, entire population level of Terra, were present at telomeres. Um, After doing this localization analysis, Irene, the master student, also do, uh, did an uh, analysis of the volume of the TRF1 foci in order to see if the, the volume of, the fo of TRF1 foci was correlating with the known telomere length. It was correlating. So she then um, analyzed the volume of TRF1 foci that were presenting Terra, so they, where Terra was localizing. And in, H, in HCT 6, uh, 1 and 16, but also in the other cell line, the other three cell lines, uh, we saw that Terra mainly are present at longer telomeres. So to TRF1 foci that, are, that have a higher volume uh, then, 72% of HCT cells and 31% of ILA cells were presenting so triple localization events. So after, sorry, after knowing and understanding the volume of TRF1, so understanding where Terra, on which telomeres are, are Terra transcript, we moved to analyze also co-localization event between Terra and TR at telomeres and found out that 72%, so 70% and 30% respectively of HCT and ILA cells were presenting the three signals, so Terra and TR at telomeres. And 20%, more between 15 and 20% of um, TRF1, so telomeres that were already positive for Terra, were also presenting the TR subunity of telomerase. So this suggests that 20%, more or less, 20% of telomeres present Terra, that present already Terra, we know that where Terra is, display also the presence of TR subunit of telomerase. So concluding, I would like to summarize the results. The first results we get is that Terra transcript localized to casual bodies, something really new, nobody knows this. Then uh, we, understand that between 70 and 100% of casual bodies that are positive for Terra are also positive for the presence of TR subunity of telomerase. Then 20% of telomeres with Terra also present TR subunity of telomerase. And that Terra foci were uh, um, Terra foci may predominantly, predominantly localize to longer telomeres. Concluding, so Terra transcript, looking at these results, we can say that Terra transcript may play a functional role in the regulation of telomerase activity, either in controlling TR local, localization at casual bodies or telomerase activity at telomeres. As future perspective, Project, we would like to investigate the dynamics of Terra localization at casual bodies and Terra TR co localization at telomeres during the cell cycle to understand when this localization happens during the cell cycle. Then, to study Terra localization dynamics in other nuclear compartments, because we saw 56% of Terra was not present. Telomeres. So a part of Terra is present at casual bodies, but we don't know where can be Terra and what does. So we would like to uh, start study uh, in PML bodies and nucleolus the localization dynamics. Then we would like to understand Terra roles in the HDR dynamics and in the formation of the subnuclear compartment under uh, down regulation, total down regulation of Terra and see what happens to all the compartments and to T 
TR and telomerase maturation. At the end, I would like to thank my lab, the entire lab, a former, a former, um, former colleague and actual colleague. And in particular, I would like to thank Emilio for giving me the possibility to be here as a, as a master student and starting with this project and continue this project as a PhD student. Then I would like to thank the Advanced Imaging Core Facility, all the three girls that helped us through the analysis of the images. And of course, is last but not the least one, um, the RNA Trafficking and Translational Control Lab, headed by Pascal Chartrand, where Irene did her master, uh, part of her master internship, and with which we collaborate, and all the members. And we we'll like thank you for the attention. Thank you, Nicole. You can relax, but <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Unfortunately, Maybe we have a couple also. of minutes for a couple of questions. Yeah. <laughs> Is there any question? Michaela. Thank you very much for your presentation. So as far as I have understood, I, I know very little about uh, the telomerase uh, RNA subunit, but yeah. uh, apparently it uh, is supposed to have a casual body localization signal, which is a, a CAB signature, uh -huh. uh, which is the one responsible for localizing yes. that transcript in the casual body. So is Terra also having that? Uh, domain, uh, or are you thinking of uh, an interaction between the two RNA components, and so it's the telomerase uh, component which brings Terra there, or what yeah. is the model here? So Terra doesn't have that particular uh, sequence tag, but uh, so Terra may interact with telomerase by base pairing because there are the telomeric repeats that can be spare. But what I think is that uh, TCAP1 that I use for as a marker for casual bodies, it is also a, a, an accessory protein of uh, telomerase because bring, uh, TCAP1 brings telomerase to casual bodies and then to telomeres. So uh, the interaction could be through TCAP1 or through by, pair, by base pairing uh, with telomerase. So I <coughs> First, the guest. Yes, nice talk. So, uh, the question so, when you said in live cells that uh, you see Terra co localizing with telomere, but not all the time, yeah. so what do you see exactly? Do you see the Terra foci that leaves and comes back, or it disappears and, and yeah. reappears? So can return to that slide if I can find it. Okay, this one. Yes. Uh, so, Terra here is localizing, then, was here, it's localizing, then disappear. I don't know if I didn't do this experiment, of course, so Emilio did this experiment, so maybe he knows better the answer. It's actually moving back and forth. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> So it means that Terra has the ability to form foci independently of yep. localizing. Another question. So have you, and have you thought to to downregulate choline or one of the markers of so the choline bodies and check whether yeah. Terra is recruited there? So uh, I thought about downregulating TCAP1 because it's important also for telomerase dynamics to see if something happens to Terra, but both Terra and telomerase. And also try, we were talking about before, uh, trying to use a calling knockout cell line in order to see if something happens to Terra, if it changes location, or I don't know, maybe the interaction with, T, with telomerase will change or something like that. Okay, so we are doing this at all. Yeah. Yeah, yes, just a curiosity. Probably I mean something because you show a lot of percentages. Yeah. So, uh, can we immortalize cells uh, just by overexpressing Terra instead to overexpress the telomerase? No, I don't think 
So, no, I think, so. Mm, in my opinion, just in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Fortunately, opinion in science doesn't count so much. <laughs> uh, is to understand this particular mechanism and interaction, is better to have um, normal presence of telomerase, so normal expression of telomerase without immortalizing cells, to see what happens in a normal condition. I don't well, know if. Was, we can immortalize cells by expressing them. Yes. The is, can you immortalize cell by ever expressing terror? No. Don't ask why. I don't know, but <laughs> maybe not. No. <laughs> no. no. I don't think so. <laughs> okay. If there are more questions, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so let's move uh, on with uh, Eloina Corradi. Eloina is a postdoc in the Armenian Harvard Axonal Neurobiology Lab, and uh, she will tell us about the pre microRNA novel transport route and the function in developing axons. Okay. The technology should uh, help life. Sometimes. Okay. Please. So, thank you for the presentation, and let's start. Okay, two sec. Good. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, I try it before. But... Okay. Here we are. So Let's start with a schematic of the brain. Our organ is a very complex one, which allowed us to accomplish with many different tasks, from easy one to very complex one. And all this is possible because during development, different regions of the brain get connected each other in a very precise way. And this is really highly regulated, and is impressive that uh, all these uh, most of the time work nicely because uh, we talk about uh, 100 billion neurons that uh, has to connect each other properly, and in average uh, we have uh, 10,000 synaptic connections each. And if we think that the world population is 7.7 .7 billion, is really uh, impressive the brain marine. So how? a neuron in such a complexity can find the right target in the right place. So the protagonist of the, of the axonal pathfinding is the growth cone. That is the, uh, the dynamic tip at the end of a growing axon. And uh, it probes uh, the surrounding environment according to the Q sense, it can orient itself. So toward an attractive Q or far from a repellent one. And it is really an autonomous compartment. Indeed, even if we sever it from the soma, the growth cone is still able to pass fine. This is possible because it contains all what is needed to sense the surrounding environment. So we have a subset of, of protein there, receptor, uh, all the cytoskeleton component to modulate its mo mobility. But we have also messenger RNA that are uh, at the axonal level. And uh, it's a sort of uh, inactive pool of protein that uh, can be ready in the right uh, space and uh, in the right time. So we have a local translation occurring there. And of course, uh, we, we see before an important layer of uh, regulation is that not all the messenger RNA are transported at the axonal level. So we have a, a repertoire of messenger RNA there, but uh, not all of them are translated at any time. So, <laughs> question mark. What are the regulatory molecules in this step? Our lab focuses on a, a regulatory molecule class of non-coding RNA, so microRNA. And I will just remind quickly uh, the pathway. So microRNA are first transcribed as prime microRNA, cleaved by drosha in pre-microRNA, exported in the cytoplasm, and finally processed by dicer into the mature active form. That is the one 
that is load on the messenger RNA and mediate the repression of the target. So at the growth cone level, agonal protein have been shown to be there. So we know that uh, microRNA metroform are active. Agonaut is part of the risk complex. But not all the agonaut uh, has been shown to be there. We and also others show that Dicer is uh, um, in this compartment. So suggesting that maybe we have a delocalization of this step also far from, uh, from the nuclei. <coughs> we verified this also in another model, in mice. And in particular, we quickly uh, told you the cellular model that we are using to study uh, the pre microRNA delocalization that are retinal ganglion cells. Are those cells that from the retina project to the chasm and uh, uh, targeting the brain? We focus uh, for the Dicer localization at the uh, mice stage where those uh, neurons reach the, the target at the brain level. Here we had the projection. And in a nuclear-free zone, you can appreciate how Dicer is, uh, is in there. So why is Dicer in, in this axonal subcompartment? Do we have a, a pre microRNA processing there? And in particular, are pre microRNA key regulatories in axon guidance process? This is the main question that we would like to address. The model that we use are RGCs, or retinal ganglion cell axons, that I just explained, but in frogs, in Zanbus levis. Why this model? Because it allows us to uh, easily have organ culture. Here's an example with a, an explant and growing axon. So we, have, um, we can study ex vivo uh, the axonal behavior, exponing uh, this growth cone to different queue and study what is going on. It's also easy to manipulate. We can uh, easily electroporate and then target in the axon with different plasmids. So those are the reasons why we select this model. And I will show you data both from ex vivo and in vivo. So first of all, we start uh, selecting the candidate through um, an eye throughput screening. So we start from uh, already publishing cell reports uh, sequence data about microRNA, but we focus on the possibility that maybe not only reads spanning the mature form are there, but also the one on in the loop region that is specific for the pre microRNA. And this allowed us to select uh, here in yellow and red promising candidates. And we verify the presence of uh, three of them that may abundant in poor axonal preparation. So poor axonal preparation is following. We culture the, the eye. And then we collect the retinal ganglion cells, so the axonal compartment, through a laser capture microdissection. And uh, we verify the absence of the dendritic mar marker MAP2 and the histone 4, so that are nuclear and dendritic free. And in this kind of sample, we show the presence of pre microRNA 181A1, A2, and 182. So something to be noticed is that 181A1 and A2 are from the same family. They share completely the 5P form, but they differ in the loop and in the 3P form. And they are differently distributed in axon because the pre microRNA 181 is more abundant than the A2. So to study more in detail how the pre microRNA reached the axonal compartment, we focus in the, on the most abundant one. And to study trafficking, in our lab, we have been developing a, um, a tool to check the endogenous trafficking of the non-coding RNA, which is the molecular beacon. It is a small stem loop structure that it opens up only if uh, the endogenous molecule is found. So we combine this system, the molecular beacon recognizing the pre-microRNA with different marker. And in particular, we start with CD63, has a marker for vesicle. Uh, it is enriched in the multivesicular body. And as you can see here, <coughs> we have a co-localization of the two signal. So really suggested that this um, pre-microRNA is transported on vesicle. And here, a movie showing the two particles moving together along the axon. So 
since it doesn't exist a single marker to characterize specific vesicles, we combine different markers to further characterize what those vesicles are. In, in particular, we use RAB5A as a marker for early endosome, RAB7A as a marker for the late endosome, and LAMP1 and LISO tracker for the lysosome compartment. And you can see here a quantification of the percentage of the pre-microRNA co-localizing with each of those markers. And clearly, we have an enrichment in terms of percentage on late endosome, so RAB7A and lysosome marker, while it drops for the early endosome marker. So this uh, suggests us that uh, this pre microRNA is transported on late endosome and lysosome. And uh, we add uh, this study with a collaborative work with the University of Turing because we were interested to understand if it was inside or outside those vesicles. Because uh, if it were inside, maybe it was for exocytosis or degradation. But uh, an important aspect is that uh, the pre microRNA is actually each hikes on the vesicle. Here uh, there is a 3D rec reconstruction at the super resolution level. And this is particularly important because it seems that the pre-microRNA is outside and there ready to be processed. So summarize what I said till now, because we start adding some elements apart from the introduction. So we have a schematic of the growth cone. We know that there are receptor and proteins already there to sense uh, this, the environment, that the local protein synthesis is uh, an important um, aspect uh, in the axonal pathfinding. But we had the DICER in this panel, and then also this pre microRNA that each hikes on those vesicles reach the compartment. So, what we wanted to, to investigate next is if those pre microRNA are locally processed in axon, and if this is playing a role in axon guidance. So the hypothesis is that uh, upon Q stimulation, we expect him somehow to have a local processing of the pre-microRNA and therefore uh, a regulation of the protein synthesis. So in particular, since our microRNA, an inhibition of the protein synthesis. First, to check uh, if we have uh, pre-microRNA local maturation, we went through this experimental paradigm. So the idea is that we wanted to investigate specifically at the axonal uh, level only what is going on. So removing <laughs> manually the explant where the soma cells are. So, and expose uh, con to specific Q those neurons and check by qPCR the level of both pre-microRNA and uh, the microRNA. So the idea is that if we have a maturation, we expected the pre-microRNA to go, goes down and the relative mature form to goes up. And this is what happened upon SEMA 3A, where the pre-microRNA 181 drops and the relative mature form goes up. While we, uh, we don't see any change upon another Q, another repellent Q that is lit to. So it seems that the pre-microRNA are matured there, and uh, this is Q-specific and also pre-microRNA specific, because the same Q, if we check the level of other pre-microRNA, they do not change. So we move uh, further to, to see what, what is the role of this uh, local processing in axon. And to investigate this, we'll use a loss of function approach, in particular designing an antisense oligonucleotide morpholino that blocks uh, the dicer cleavage site. And we uh, transfected only in the axonal compartment. So here uh, we verify that this system actually works. And indeed, uh, in the control transfected axon, we still have an increase of the mature form upon SEMA 3A, while in the transfected with the morpholino, we block uh, um, the, the processing. So using this uh, morpholino, we wanted to investigate more the axonal behavior. So a way to do it uh, uh, on a plate, ex vivo, is to check if the repellent queue is, uh, is able to make the growth cone collapsed. That is what we expect. And we count the collapsed growth cone over the total number uh, of growth cone in the plate. And the, in the control, we have a, a, a 60% of collapsed growth cone while by blocking the processing, we don't have uh, any more such a, such a response. 
So those data really uh, show us that uh, the newly generated microRNA are crucial for, for growth cone behavior. And going back to this schematic, we have now some more elements because we see that SEMA3A stimulation gives rise to the processing of the 181A1, but we don't know yet what is regulating and why this processing happened. So to investigate uh, this final step, we went through first a uh, candidate selection with a bioinformatic approach, considering also the conservation of the target and the geoterm. And our favorite candidate has been uh, uh, tube free, so an isoform of tubulin. Tubulin is a component of the microtubule, and microtubules are very important for the motility of the growth cone and undergo to uh, polymerization and depolymerization all the time. And it's fitting our observation that uh, SEMA 3A inducing depolymerization of the microtubule might also regulating the local translation of tubulin. And to study local translation, we use the uh, Venus system. Venus is a, um, is a fast bleaching and also fast folding protein. And we clone the free prime UTR of uh, tube free, the wild type one, and also the one mutating the binding site for the microRNA. We electroporate it and then uh, we frap it, so is a, we measure the fluorescent recovery after photo bleaching of this construct, aspecting a recovery when the local translation occurs at the axonal level. So what we expected is that in the wild type and the mutated one, when the pre microRNA is not processed, so under in an unstimulated condition, in both cases we expected a recovery of the signal so that the protein is actually locally translated. While uh, upon SEMA 3A, we expected uh, to, have a not, to not have a recovery in the signal if our protein is actually regulated by the microRNA and expected still a recovery uh, in the mutated one. And this is what we observe for, for tube three. So here I have the single axon pre-bleaching and then following in time from zero to 10 minutes. And here the quantification for all the condition. So in the wild type, we have an increase in the fluorescent signal that drops upon sema 3 a <coughs> While in the mutated, even upon SEMA 3A, we don't observe uh, such a decrease in the, in the translation. And as a control, we add also the cyclohexamide, so uh, blocking the, the translation, a blocking translation. And we verify that it in, indeed drop again to the basal level as the control without three prime UTR. We investigate also what uh, happened in vivo. Uh, so electroporate again the venous um, plasmid. We uh, remove the, the eye in order to avoid the trafficking from the soma and expose the brain. So here is a schematic of the brain with the RGC projection. And in particular, we look at the target region where SEMA 3A is expressed and repeat uh, the experiment in vivo. So here we have an example of what uh, we uh, look at. And it's an example not only of the FRAP, but also of an axonal pathfinding, because uh, here uh, we have the entrance of the, the growth cone in the tectum. And in the 10 minutes movie, you can see that it's also trying to find its way from one side to the other, and then moving on. And we measure the recovery in the of the signal in vivo. And this is the quantification. So uh, the, the basal level is always our free, uh, without free prime UTR control. And we can uh, uh, notice that uh, in the SEMA 3A region, the mutated is, uh, is higher. So also in vivo, TUP3 is downregulated where SEMA 3A is expressed. So finally, we wanted also to have a link between, direct link between the tube three and um, the microRNA. And in particular, we repeat this uh, collapse assay. So with the control, transfected uh, our morpholino blocking the processing, but also with a double knockout of the uh, blocking the processing and tube three. 
And this uh, uh, is what is going on. So again, upon SEMA3A, we have in the control an increased level of collapse that is dropping when we block uh, the processing, as I showed before. But uh, uh, we observe a, res a rescue uh, if we knock down also tube free. So the proposed model is uh, the following. Uh, in a, uh, under no stimulation conditions, so without SEMA3A, we have a, a tube-free basal translation. In both cases, we, ha we have this trafficking of the pre-microRNA. And uh, uh, le let's focus here. So we, we have a sort of off-on system where upon SEMA3A, the pre-microRNA is processed and is actually down-regulated to free. So we are moving from a local protein synthesis of tubulin to a local protein synthesis inhibition upon the processing. So this uh, was a slide of uh, my introduction. And I hope we, uh, we still have a question mark, because of course there are other regulatory mechanisms. But what I presented are a key class of regulators that are not only the microRNA, but also the newly generated microRNA. And I wanted to finish with this, uh, putting together two works of our lab. So under unstimulated condition, we know now that there are pre-microRNAs there, and that uh, there are also um, mature microRNAs that are keeping silent specific messenger RNA. This is uh, our previous work, where upon uh, slit 2, we have the relief of uh, the repression from one microRNA, so it is uh, allowing the local protein synthesis of a target. And what I show you now is that upon another repellent queue, so SEMA3A, we have the processing of pre-microRNA silencing tube free. So we have both local protein synthesis and the inhibition of it. And so I would like to thank my supervisor, Marie Laure Baudet, all the members that work on this project, our collaborators, the facility here at Chibio, and our funding. And thank you all for your attention. So thank you already. <laughs> Thank you, very nice. So I have uh, two questions. Yeah. Uh, one is related to uh, the fact that in my understanding on the classical function of uh, microRNA globally, typically microRNAs have many different targets, uh, not only one. Here you show a sort of one-to-one -one with tubulin. And uh, on the other hand, typically one expects a mild, where you have a quite apparently, I cannot judge from the FRAP, but it seems that you have a strong down regulation of the protein, mm -hmm. while in the model that I studied, uh, you had uh, a mild down regulation of many possible targets. So I would like you to explain how it works here. And the other question is related to what I may missed uh, in the last right. model, is what is the signal? You say there is a Q, a sort of uh, mm -hmm. stimuli, and uh, the microRNA, the pre, is processed locally. But I didn't understand what is the pathway that leads to this processing. Is DICER uh, okay. post-translationally regulated? What is there, the signaling? Thank you. OK. So the uh, first part about microRNA is uh, indeed like that, in the sense that one microRNA is targeting uh, several messenger RNA. And indeed, even for my FRAP experiment, it has been not the only candidate that I investigate. So we check uh, uh, the protein synthesis of many targets. Then tubulin was the, the one regulating, uh, uh, regulated by our microRNA. So there is also the layer that not all the ones that are predicted to be target are target. And then it is indeed that uh, other targets of the microRNA are there, for sure. <laughs> um, related to the phenotype, so uh, it might be that uh, uh, other uh, so target and proteins are involved. And we were also surprised by uh, picking up something uh, uh, I mean, so strong. So it, uh, it uh, really means that that microRNA is abundant and play a huge role there to have uh, uh, such a phenotype. 
Uh, we observe also, I didn't show here, but uh, in, the, in, uh, in vivo, so we, we check the animal and the visual system of the animal. And the, in that case, uh, we still have a phenotype, but let's say milder. So in the complexity on the in vivo animal, you, you appreciate more what you were saying, probably. And I think the first question, more or less, uh, <laughs> I mean, then is open exactly. Of course, there will be others, and uh, might explain better why we have such a strong phenotype. While uh, the second, no, Dices. the dicer. Okay, we don't know. We have several hypotheses. Indeed, I didn't present it. So what we know is that uh, is specific for the Q. So indeed, is SEMA 3A related and not others, and that is pre-microRNA specific. So probably it's not something directly related to the activation of Dicer, because otherwise you expected an overall processing of the pre-microRNA. So we don't know. It might be linked with the pathway, uh, with maybe an RNA binding protein that is still keeping uh, the, um, the pre-microRNA. So there are, is still a speculation. <laughs> Yeah, let's stay on speculation. <laughs> Great. <laughs> That's very good. So I'm, I'm very curious about the, the staining of the vesicle and the microRNA and the relative size of the okay. stain. So can you tell me something? Because are you sure that these are vesicles? Have you tried to stain with lipids? Have you tried, sorry, to? To stain the lipids part of the vesicle with some uh, so dye. We actually combine uh, the different marker also to be sure of what yeah, we but were. Yeah, are all proteins, right? Yes. So, if you talk about vesicle, in okay. theory you should have also lipids, no? Yeah. So it is something indeed that we can uh, add actually. So the, the super resolution we also uh, run it uh, in collaborator with the University of Torino, and we ask also people more. Uh, uh, let's say, vesicle expert than the RNA side that were our lab to check also this aspect. And uh, if uh, the percentage that we were finding or the behavior in the trafficking were what expected or not. So in theory, I, I mean... The signature is <laughs> Exactly. Is there. Then and of and about the, the size of the two stain, that, that looks quite the, similar. Of the, uh, of the vesicle and the pre -microne. So at that resolution, we cannot appreciate uh, probably, um, I mean, it, it is difficult. In any case, it's super resolution. But uh, for the CD63, is in, in any case an interluminal um, marker. And we don't appreciate the single very small vesicle in the, so of course, uh, we, we have to uh, still increase the resolution to, to really reply what uh, what you are asking. Also because there were cases in which uh, we observe not only one MB signal, but two pre microRNA particles. And of, um, the resolution should still to be increased, probably, to evaluate uh, the relative size. Or okay. if are more pre microRNA together yeah, that exactly. are giving yeah. signal. Yeah. And uh, so, I don't know. Fine, thank you. Uh, yes, so it has recently been shown, and I think it's annexin 11, that tethers mRNA to endosome in neurons. Yeah. So did you check if it is a tether for the pre-microRNA? Pre no, but uh, indeed it is, uh, yeah, it's a 2018-19 paper. It's very recent, so we were very interested in the work because, of course, uh, there open up uh, possible links also with the... Uh, the old slab show also that endosome can work as platform for a local translation. So we have recent work that suggests uh, other possible experiment. And I expect to have a link there, but we didn't. And any idea of the protein that binds the pre microRNA that could explain why it's not processed in the soma? Or? Uh, OK, so related to the so, so not processing to the soma and to the. So we start uh, also for this with a bioinformatic approach. So we have a list of candidates, but uh, um, we are starting now that part. So we, 
we don't know exactly. Okay, other question? No, if not, thank you. Okay, thank you. So now uh, the third uh, talk uh, by Fabio Lauria. Fabio is a postdoc uh, in the laboratory of uh, translational architect architectomics uh, at the Institute of Biophysics uh, CNI. So I'm Fabio Lauria. I'm working at, in, uh, at the laboratory of translation architectomics uh, here in Trento um, for the Institute of Biophysics. And today I'm going to present our data about uh, SMN primed uh, ribosomes and how they modulate uh, um, translation uh, of transcripts related to spinal muscular atrophy. So starting from the beginning, uh, so spinal muscular atrophy is a neurodegenerative disease that we its incidence of one in 10,000 of newborn is the leading cause of um infant mortality associated to a genetic disease. Uh, it's caused by um, uh, mutations or deletion of uh, the um, survival motor neuron gene, uh, which in turn causes uh, a decreased level of SMN protein. Uh, SMA uh, primarily uh, affects uh, alpha motor neurons, uh, which uh, uh, leads to um, um, muscle uh, uh, weakness and respiratory failures. And in the worst uh, uh, case, so in the, in the most severe type of SMA, to the death of the uh, children before the two years of age. So as you can see clearly from uh, this uh, introduction, the, main, the major point here is uh, the SMN protein and uh, the loss of this protein uh, in SMA. So a few words about SMN. So SMN is a protein that uh, is involved in uh, many uh, different functions. Uh, the most established and also the most studied is uh, the, the role um, in uh, the biogenesis, its role in the biogenesis of uh, small nuclear and small nuclear uh, ribonucleoproteins uh, and uh, the formation of this plisosome. But SMN is actually more than this because uh, we know now that it's involved in uh, many other processes. So for example, axonal transport of specific genes and transcripts and uh, also mitochondrial activity, um, proteostasis and uh, in particular translation. So we know that SMN is connected to, to um, the translationary machines, so polysomes, and we know that loss of SMN is also associated to impairment of translation. So uh, these uh, um, uh, observations that we also uh, published a couple of years ago um, lead, led to a, a question. So is SMN a ribosome associated factor. So is SMN <coughs> one of those uh, say elements, uh, so additional proteins or modification of ribosomal RNA or ribosomal protein that uh, um, makes some ribosomes highly specific for translating a specific group of transcripts. So is SMN involved in uh, this relatively new scenario of uh, specialized or primed ribosomes. Uh, if so, it's obvious that SMN can directly affect the movement and the flux, uh, the flux of uh, ribosomes and uh, obviously so uh, affecting the translation. Uh, so the first point to uh, answer this question is to assess the binding of SMN to ribosomes. So for this, we use recombinant SMN and um, uh, SMN-free ribosomes from NSC34 um, cells that do not express SMN. And we actually observe a co-sedimentation of uh, SMN protein with ribosomal protein RPL26. And uh, a different concentration, we also observe an increase of this binding uh, in vitro. But also in vivo, we got the same uh, uh, results, so confirmation of uh, SMN binding uh, to uh, ribosomes. In fact, uh, with the subcellular fractionation uh, coupled with uh, salt wash, we observed that SMN is uh, uh, tightly um, connected to ribosomes uh, before and after the salt wash and also after treatment uh, with uh, RNAs. So suggesting that this interaction is not uh, RNA dependent. 
So now that we assess that SMN is actually um, bound to ribosomes, uh, we would like to understand which is uh, the role of this binding. So uh, SMN, uh, does SMN um, has a role um, a pop that positively um, um, influence translation or, or not? So for this, um, we perform a transcription translation assay with a recombinant SMN at different concentration and uh, a reporter uh, GFP in this, in this case, and we observe an increase of uh, the production of uh, GFP, both from uh, Western blot but also by looking at the Florence signal, uh, that is associated to the uh, increase of SMN. So suggesting that some SMN actually uh, enhance uh, translation and help translation. And uh, this was confirmed also when we um, look at the connection, the binding of SMN with uh, actively translating ribosomes that we uh, isolated using the ribolase technology. And also in this case, uh, we observed that SMN actually binds uh, ribosomes that are uh, translating and uh, this binding is lost when uh, we um, treat our data with puromycin that basically uh, stops translation. So um, at this point we know that SMN binds ribosomes and that these ribosomes are likely to be active, so uh, translating. Uh, these ribosomes with SMN bound to them, uh, I'm going to call them uh, from now on uh, SMN primed ribosomes. So next question was uh, where these uh, ribosomes are positioned along uh, the coding sequence or along the RNAs. So to answer this question, we performed a ribosome profiling assay after immunoprecipitation of SMN. So basically we extracted the fragment of RNAs that are covered by uh, SMN prime ribosomes. And uh, after um, identifying the precise uh, say, position of the P site of the ribosomes in this uh, ribosome protect <laughs> protected fragment, we were able to uh, localize the, the ribosomes at a single nucleotide resolution along the uh, RNAs. So here you have an example of a meta profile. So here the uh, height of the signal is proportional to the um, uh, to the amount of p site at the specific region. He have a coding sequence, the initial part of the coding sequence, the last part, and the three prime UTR and the five prime UTR. And you can see that you, we have an enrichment of p site at the beginning of the coding, of the coding sequence, and especially in the first five codons. What is uh, interesting at this point is that this meta profile can be split in two according to the length of the reads that uh, contribute to, them, to this profile. So you can see that these peaks on the, on, uh, uh, the right of the profile are associated to short reads, uh, while this big peak at the beginning uh, is associated to uh, longer reads. So this uh, suggests that uh, um, some uh, conformational changes occur uh, on ribosomes that are accumulating at the beginning of the coding sequence. This accumulation were fa uh, was further uh, uh, confirmed by uh, this plot. Here uh, I uh, plotted the uh, ratio between the average signal here in this uh, position, so the first five codon, uh, with respect to average signal on the whole coding sequence. And you can see here that we have, uh, uh, that this distribution is uh, significantly higher with respect to uh, the same distribution uh, from a classic RiboSeq. So meaning that actually SMN special, uh, primed ribosomes uh, are accumulating at the beginning of the coding sequence. Uh, then we uh, move forward uh, looking at the uh, function of the proteins that are produced by SMN uh, uh, by these transcripts that are enriched in um, SMN prime ribosomes. So these transcripts, uh, I'm going to call them SMN specific transcripts. So are transcripts that are enriched in ribosomes bound by SMN. And uh, we can see clearly that there are uh, um, three main uh, groups, so three main uh, um, uh, processes uh, that uh, involve the distances. So one is uh, uh, neuronal growth and other neuron activities. And you can see in the, the field dot here are all uh, associated to neuron specific functions. Then we have uh, chromatin remodeling uh, here and uh, mitochondrial translation. 
Um, we were curious about uh, uh, some features that can characterize this SMN specific uh, um, transcripts, uh, and so we analyzed uh, the sequences of uh, three prime UTR, five prime UTR, and the coding sequence. What came out uh, is that uh, on the five prime UTR, uh, there is an enrichment for the SMN specific transcript in uh, iris, so internal uh, ribosomal entry site. Uh, suggesting that uh, the translation of this uh, transcript is not uh, CAP dependent. Uh, moreover, we discover also that there is uh, an enrichment on the first uh, five codons of the coding sequence. So remember, where there is this accumulation of SMN prime ribosomes, uh, there is an enrichment of rare codons. So codons that uh, codify specifically for arginine. So basically, this is, uh, um, let's say, uh, shared, uh, um, uh, these are the two shared features among SMS specific transcripts. So we have iris on the 5' UT uh, UTR and uh, rare codons at the beginning of the coding sequence. And this is so the model that we propose for the activity of these SMN, uh, SMN prime ribosomes. Uh, so they uh, basically start the translation at the uh, translation start site with SMN bound to them, and then they proceed uh, with the first steps of translation, and uh, possibly here in this position some conformational changes occur, because remember the two different sizes of ribosome, ribosome protected fragments. Then here there is a pause at the fifth column that is particularly important because we know that this is a site for functional posing of ribosomes in order to have a proper translation after on. Then SMN dissociates and the translation continues. Uh, this is obviously uh, everything uh, uh, is fine in healthy condition, but the point is what happens when SMN is lost, so in the case of uh, uh, SMA, um, so to answer this question, we uh, perform a ribosome profiling assay, uh, est uh, isolating uh, uh, acti active rib ribosomes and uh, uh, the fragments that are covered by active ribosomes in uh, uh, healthy and uh, um, early symptomatic uh, um, mouse brains. Uh, so comparing SMA with the control, uh, we got uh, two sets of uh, um, transcripts that show uh, alteration in the number of ribosomes. And uh, the biggest one, so almost 70% of, the, uh, of these uh, uh, transcripts are, uh, let's say, show a decrease in the number of ribosomes. That is this, uh, um, this bar here. That makes sense because we know that uh, loss, uh, loss of SMN uh, causes impairment in translation, so it makes sense that the number of ribosomes decrease. Uh, another point that is quite interesting is that uh, most of the SMN, uh, so at this point we have SMN specific transcripts and we have a, a pool of uh, transcripts that show a decreased number of uh, ribosomes in SMA. Uh, and most of SMN specific transcripts actually uh, show a decrease in the number of ribosomes uh, when SMN is lost. So this is the same network that I showed you before, and now in red you can see those genes uh, that show a decreased number of ribosomes, and you can see clearly that a lot of them are actually in this, uh, in this group. But this is not, so the identity of these transcripts is not uh, the only point of contact between SMN specific transcripts and the one with uh, impaired translation. In fact, uh, uh, for uh, this uh, pool uh, identified by ribosic, ribosome, active ribosome profiling, uh, there is again an enrichment in uh, iris on the five prime UTRs of this transcript that is specific for uh, this uh, transcript that uh, display a decreased number of ribosomes, but not for uh, the ones that show an increased number of ribosomes or the ones that are invariant. And we uh, also observe the same uh, properties, so the fact that iris are uh, crucial also by dual luciferase assay. Then another point is that, uh, again, at the beginning of the coding sequence, there is an enrichment of codons that codify for arginine, so again, rare codons that codify for arginine. So it is the very same properties that we already 
um, uh, observed for uh, uh, SMN specific uh, transcripts. Uh, and also here we confirm uh, this, uh, uh, this property by Lucy Fraser say. But uh, there is another thing that is connected to these uh, rare codons, uh, and that it is the fact that arginine is uh, basically the um, so codons that codify for arginine are the ones that show also the, um, the strongest defects in uh, ribosome occupancy. So the level of ribosomes on these codons is the ones that is most uh, dysregulated, uh, say most variable, uh, in SMA with respect to the control. And since uh, there is an enrichment at the beginning of the coding sequence, we uh, would expect to, um, to see uh, something going on again uh, in this region, so in the first five codons of, uh, um, uh, of this transcript. And uh, it, this is actually the case. So here you can see um, again the ratio between the average signal at the beginning of the coding sequence and the average signal on the whole coding sequence for uh, SMN specific transcript using the signal coming from the ribosic in the control and SMA. And you can see clearly that there is a decrease here of the distribution in SMA. So suggesting that we lose some ribosomes at the beginning of the coding sequence. Uh, but it's not uh, the major point here because uh, the uh, ribosomes that are still there are uh, placed in a completely different uh, way with respect to the control. So you can see here two overlaying uh, meta profiles again for control in gray and SMN, uh, SMA in, uh, in red. And you can see that in the third and in the fifth position, we have differences in the amount of p at the specific position. And in particular, we lose ribosomes in both cases. And again, remember that this is the region where we observe enrichment in rare codons and also enrichment in SMN uh, primed ribosomes. And this feature, uh, as you can see here, is specific for this pool of transcripts, while for the unspecific task we don't have this kind of differences. Um, so summarizing what we, uh, what we observed is uh, first that uh, SMN prime ribosomes uh, um, uh, binds preferentially the first, uh, um, the first uh, codons of the coding sequence, the first five codons of the coding sequence, uh, that there are some features that characterize these transcripts, so the presence of iris uh, sequences uh, on the five prime UTR and also of rare codons at the beginning of the coding sequence, and that the, S, the loss of SMN causes loss of actively translating ribosome, especially again at the beginning of the coding sequence and especially on the third and the fifth codons. So uh, pulling everything together, here is the, the model that I showed you before for the healthy condition, and here is what we propose in case of loss of SMA, of SMN, so for SMA. So here, when SMN is not bound to ribosomes, ribosomes are not able to bind properly the transcript, so there is some uh, dysregulation in their movement, and then uh, the two subunits possibly detaches, and the translation is impaired. And this explains, obviously, also the impairment, the general impairment of translation that we observed also in our previous uh, work. So basically, this is uh, the big picture of what we are uh, doing. Uh, I would like to thank so, the, the World Lab here, especially Gabriel Laviero, uh, Thomas Tebaldi, that now is at Yale University, our collaborator in Edinburgh, and uh, also our uh, funding uh, uh, organizations. If you are more interested in uh, uh, some more details about this work. Here there are papers that we uh, already published and we are trying to publish. And uh, final slide, just uh, if you are interested also in our activities, we are on Facebook, on uh, Twitter, we are uh, uh, developing our website so you cannot miss us. And uh, uh, there are also two positions uh, for postdocs if you want to join us. So we are waiting for you. Okay. Uh, Okay. Thank you, Fabio, for this very interesting talk. Well, perhaps the CBBM could advise the two postdoc positions. So, questions? So, uh, it's really a curiosity. Um, 
Do you know if, because I don't know, but it has all the feature to be that. Uh, is uh, SMN, uh, besides the uh, disease uh, and the reduced level in the SMN disease, itself. do you know if this protein is post-translationally modified, uh, in particular if it is arginine methylated, and if this has uh, plays a role uh, uh, in... I, I don't know about this, but for sure it's something that we are going, I mean, we are going to explore this uh, possible uh, arginine methylation uh, <laughs> For also for other proteins that we are uh, in our list of targets, uh, so uh, yeah, it's possible, uh, but we still don't know. Present, you don't know. Uh, not, not really. Not. No. No. Okay. So my question is, you, you mentioned irises that are present at the five prime end of yeah. your transcripts, or uh, those transcripts that possibly are uh, mainly translated by uh, the ribosomes decorated with the uh, SNM protein. Uh, do you have any evidence of, uh, um, let's say, uh, the function of these irises in the regulation, so the cap-independent translation. So is there a functional evidence that these are really working as irises? You are probably aware of all the controversy yeah. that is yeah, so ongoing on irises. And so uh, the thing that I can say up to now is that uh, here, for example, we, uh, so in this, uh, um, in this experiment, so we use uh, here an iris uh, in between uh, Renilla and Firefly. And uh, when we treat the, our sample with rapamycin that basically block, uh, blocks uh, um, cap-dependent translation, we have uh, an uh, an increase in the difference between, uh, um, say, um, translation uh, between a sample with 100% uh, of SMN and the ones that resemble the SMA. So it seems that uh, it, when you block the uh, cap dependent translation, uh, these differences are uh, improved. So as you um, remove, uh, uh, um, let's say, um, wait. Um, so we see differences in any case. So here we have these differences between 100% and 20% of SMN. And this difference is even higher when we block um, cap-dependent translation. So it seems that actually the iris has a role and help translation. And so it seems that actually there is something going on with them. And uh, for sure, so this is one of the spelling that we are uh, we did, uh, and uh, the one with uh, the block of dependent uh, cap dependent translation. So I would say yes. Uh, it's uh, so Thank you. Uh, yeah. The other, it's just a comment. I mean, uh, the, uh, when looking at this uh, uh, RRTR sequence, yeah. and of course one might wonder what is coming later, but uh, it came to my mind that there are some cell penetrating peptides which are arginine rich and they're used uh, in fact to have nucleic acids get into uh, they, they are being coupled with nucleic acids to get them inside the cells or inside the nucleus so maybe this uh, has also a role it's a common role of this uh, terminal of the protein somehow uh, I know that for you it's it's a signature yeah, of... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. In, up to now it's only a signature uh, that seems to be functional for uh, defects, uh, but yeah. Thank you. Okay, if there are no, no more questions, no? Okay, thank you, Fabio. <laughs> and uh, I would like to thank uh, Eduardo, of course, for uh, his talk and uh, all the speakers. I would like also to thank Tiziana and uh, uh, in extension the CBBM that allows us to, to, to do this uh, lecture. And I would like to thank our fi filmmakers and uh, the, all the presentation will be posted uh, on the CBBM site. And of course, uh, I thank also Mara, who is not here, who organized uh, everything, and of course, all of you for being here until the end. Thank you. <laughs>